he's going to zoom. He's, he's zooming on. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we are now um, online. And uh, first of all, a uh, very, very warm welcome to everybody for the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee meeting for the 5th of September. An extra special welcome to um, Bill Harris. Wonderful to have you back around the, the council table, um, Bill. And of course, we've just uh, formally welcomed you back as well. Okay, um, first of all, we'll call for apologies. Now, I understand that we have Philip online. Philip, are you there? We won't be able to see you because we've got some issues, but are you online and, and can hear us clearly? No. Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Liz. Um, yep, I'm online. Um, I'm <laughs> starting a personal development course down in Martinbridge tonight and driving down there this afternoon. So I'll be leaving at about 11.30 um and i'm i'm up at my ski lodge now so i'm sort of halfway halfway uh halfway point so um, okay. i'll be leaving thank you, to philip. Get down there. thank you philip that's um yeah lovely to have you online okay uh let's move on to the disclosures of members interest do we have any this morning no okay that's all good uh any late items no late items, lovely. Confirmation of order of the meeting. Everyone happy with that? Okay, thank you, Roger. Thank you, Claire. All in favour? Against carried. Uh, moving on to the confirmation of the minutes. Now, we do have a small um, amendment here. So I'm just going to read out the, um, the amendment so that the opening, that the open minutes of the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee meetings held on the 1st of August 2023, because there were two, that's why we've got plural meetings. Having been circulated, be taken as read and confirmed as a true and correct record of that meeting, subject to minor typographical errors. Now, are there any other changes to those minutes that anyone would like to make? Otherwise, that's the amended recommendation. Yep, thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Lou. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. All right, thanks to everyone for that. Okay, we're going to move on to our um, our hearing today. And uh, very warm welcome to Graham. Graham, we're seeing lots of you at the moment. We've been busy, haven't we? So uh, this, of course, is our public places bylaw review. This is our hearing, and we've got uh, some submitters to speak to this morning, and we'll be doing our deliberations today as well. Over to you, Graham. Okay, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, this is continuing the special consultative procedure for the review of the Public Places Bylaw 2018. Um, this has led to amendments of the form of the bylaw, including the removal of pre existing legislation and repetitions. We've changed some definitions, um, the purpose of the bylaw. Uh, council powers to designate loading zones, emergency vehicle parking and where U-turns are prohibited, and also the designation of roads subject to light vehicle restrictions. We've got confirmation on street signage and berm parking regulations, and that was all consulted from the 16th of June to the 16th of July. This included general media and social media uh, uh, messaging, direct consultation with the community boards and the business community via the business chambers. A total of 15 submissions have been received on this one, and three submitters have asked to present submissions to the committee this morning. Um, thank you. That's all I need to say. I think we can move Oops. on unless there are any questions on my report at this stage. Okay, no, thank you, um, Graham. Okay, well, as uh, Graham mentioned, we have three submitters. Um, we have Kelly Bouzet from the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce. Um, she is on Zoom. Kelly, I'm afraid we can't see you. We're having a few technical problems this morning, but I'm quite confident we'll be able to hear you. Um, are you there, first of all? Hi, Liz, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks, Kelly. Oh, I was a, what, just a smidge worried we weren't there for a second. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, um, you can take your, um, obviously, your submission as read. Uh, but yeah, the floor is yours. Um, and uh, we will no doubt have some questions for you at the end. 
Wonderful, and, and thank you for having me here today to be heard. Um, I also hope that you have a document that we prepared uh, and sent through via Graham, which gave a little bit more detail to, I guess, why the Chamber is involved in this space. And I'm really just going to work through that. So can I just confirm you all have that document? On Thanks, Chamber Kelly. Yeah, yes, we have a printed version. Um, Wonderful. Uh, and every councillor has one. Yep. Thank you. So ultimately, this stems from <clears throat> our advocacy work within the equine industry around welfare of animals and the impact of fireworks. And our um, submission was supported by Cambridge Raceway, the Jockey Club, New Zealand Thoroughbred Association, and Harness Racing New Zealand, just to name a few. Um, it's a long game to drive change at a central government level, enabling local government to enact law, bylaw changes concerning private use of fireworks. That said, councils, as you well know, um, can and do make bylaws regulating use of private fireworks in public places, and we're certainly asking for your support. So we see two opportunities. The first is to ensure that there are no roadside fireworks traders um, within our boundaries based on that clause 19.8 that says no trader shall offer for sale or provide any goods or services that are subject to any statutory age-related access restrictions. For example, goods with R18. And of course, as we know, fireworks are an R18 product. We, would, we just felt that the staff comments in response to our submission were a little bit ambiguous. And I guess we're looking for assurance that this, these traders are not permitted. Um, we called a company actually, who I won't name, but they they trade in Cambridge during that fireworks sale period, and they certainly confirmed that they'll be here in Cambridge in November, which just left us wondering and hence to um, raise that request in the bylaw submission. We're also advocating for prohibition of private fireworks in public spaces. And look, we recognise that enforcing such a ban presents challenges, but it does establish what we think is a clear boundary and represents a really progressive step limiting the, the places in which fireworks can be employed. We've also mentioned that the warehouse made the decision to cease the sale of fireworks, citing a misalignment of the company's values. And I guess we're asking elected members to consider our own values in the context of being both the equine capital of New Zealand and a title we proudly promote, Waipa Home of Champions. Surely, therefore, a heightened focus on animal welfare, mindful of our sport horses, naturally aligns with those values. We know each year that council receive, receives complaints from individuals um, with you know, pet and livestock issues, um, distressed over fireworks issues. And we know also that many go unreported, but if you've got animals, you'll have seen their trauma when there are fireworks around. Furthermore, Countdown Supermarket ceased firework sales in 2019, and their research indicated that a majority of customers preferred public firework displays over private home celebrations. Acknowledging this, pro this preference and in support of both change and education, the Cambridge Chamber pursued and successfully obtained event funding from Waipa District Council for a free community event. This funding supports a cause-driven event we've named Illuminate, and it's a light and sound show set out at the Mighty River Domain, um, and it presents an alternative to traditional fireworks displays on, on Guy Fawkes uh, weekend this year, and aims to raise awareness about animal welfare and stress at fireworks cause and domestic and livestock. So we are in fact asking elected members to support these small steps forward here in our own backyard and enable positive change. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, very succinct. And um, yeah, I think that uh, you've made your points well. Are there any questions from the members around the table? <clears throat> Claire. Um, morning, Kelly, this is um, Claire St. Pierre, um, <clears throat> councillor. Um, I think I'm getting the message about your concern to do with um, the private use of fireworks. And in fact, I was really rapt to see um, that event that's been proposed, that's the sound and light um, yeah, extravaganza, I guess it sounds really exciting. So I applaud you for that. I'm just a bit uncomfortable about you wanting um, the bylaw 
um, to cover fireworks when um, people can buy fireworks online. So you're not advocating for a total ban of fireworks outright and yet people that are buying fireworks um, from mobile traders um, yeah, aren't necessarily going to be intending to use them in a public place. So I just wanted to understand like that's quite a, a further step along towards prohibiting them altogether really. Hi Claire, thanks for your comments. Um, so you're right, we're, we're just taking small steps at a time. We're not asking for a total ban of fireworks. We also know that people can drive to a number of places in the Waikato and purchase and, and, and that's all well and good. What we want to do is just start to raise that awareness and start to reduce the availability and give people alternative options um, with the likes of the light and sound show. Mm. Yeah, thanks, um, Claire. Look, um, I guess, Kelly, when, when I think about Cambridge and, uh, you know, how proud we are of our town, one um, sentence in your submission here really resonates with me, and that's, that's this, that this prompts us to consider our own values in the context of being the equine capital of New Zealand, a title we proudly associate with Waipa Homer Champions. So what, we're, what you're really saying is let's try and protect, you know, um, things that we hold dear and business in our livelihoods and all the businesses associated with uh, some of the primary industries are affected by fireworks, no, no question around it, but equine in particular, because horses really just don't like those loud bangs in the sky. So I really applaud um, your, your steps in this direction. I appreciate this. They are, this will be a journey, as you said, this is just a small step, but I am interested, Kelly, in, um, in your work with uh, Louise Upston, MP, have you managed to sort of progress um, kind of any sort of um, progress with that? Um, yeah, thanks, Liz, for the endorsement of that of that um, and the protection of the equestrian industry. Louise is a little preoccupied currently um, <laughs> heading into the election, but certainly we've had, uh, as you know, a number of conversations and an acknowledgement from her office that she can and will advocate. And I think we just need to pick the right timing to further pursue those conversations. Yeah, no, thanks. And, and I agree with you um, and agree with Councillor St. Pierre actually around the, the event, because of course, this is gonna offer an alternative. So this is, there will be no fireworks. This is a light and sound show. So hopefully people will see this as an opportunity to, to do something, um, to attend. And hopefully this will just you know, decrease the number of uh, public fireworks displays that people might have or private use in their own homes and backyards as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Any other questions for Kelly? Lou? Yeah, thank you. Lou Brown from uh, Town Media, uh, Kelly. Um, just quickly, um, I have a few issues here. One is that I know that the equine industry is hit with it, but one of the biggest problems for me with fireworks is that particularly after Christmas one to November is pyrotechnics actually set fire to things. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we have a dry year, that it is a big problem. Uh, the second thing is that we have in our uh, local area, the local speedway uh, in Kiki, for example, which opens every year with a fireworks display, uh, which is quite a significant event in our local area. Now, I do realize that that is actually located very, very close to the equine industry. Um, you know, there is a polygram not very far and Councillor Gow is nodding his head as he looks at me at uh, a lot of these people are very close to it. Will we ban all this sort of thing? And the third thing I want to raise with you is it's a cultural aspect here that after Christmas, when I live on Pickett Hill, uh, we see in the Chinese New Year a significant amount of fireworks uh, actually being delay, uh, displayed within the whole area. So uh, all of these issues, I think, have to be addressed. So they have they have a, a significant cultural effect to many of the Asian cultures anyway, and uh, rather than what we're doing. So I just want to raise those with you and see what you had to think about it and what you had to say. Yeah, thanks, Lou. Look, you raise a number of really good points. I mean, it, it's a broad topic. You know, fireworks are not environmentally friendly. They certainly have the potential for, you know, fire. And I think there was some example or an example down in Queenstown. So I guess we're, we're breaking this into bite-sized pieces with, you know, as I stated, the long-term advocacy plan. 
Um, you're right. I mean, obviously, we're very mindful. My mandate is Cambridge, your WIPA, and it does touch on events like the Kihi Kihi Fireworks programs. Um, that's not really for me to wade into. But again, we support public um, events rather than ad hoc private. So over time, you know, maybe they can or will consider doing, you know, drone shows or other light and sound alternatives, but, you know, time will tell. We're not pressing on those buttons at this point in time. And you're right, fireworks are definitely not um, constrained to, you know, Guy Fawkes, New Year's celebrations. In fact, one of the ways in which we waded into this advocacy was an incident out at Karapiro over New Year's where private um, and insignificant fireworks set um, some horses into absolute, um, you know, crazy behavior. They absolutely panicked and that horses, as we know, are flight animals. So um, again, if we can help educate that if you're letting off fireworks and you have horses, animals, cats, dogs, whatever the case may be, talk to your neighbors, be mindful of that. That's a really good starting point for ourselves and to ensure that you know people can't take fireworks to public parks and just start setting them off. Again, it's another step in the right direction. Uh, Mike Pettit. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, good morning, Kelly. Um, hey, my question is around, you've talked to the pyrotechnics company, the mm -hmm. folks, I guess, that operate out of that um, container. Have, do you know if they've already purchased or made their purchase order for this year? Hi, Mike. Um, no, but you can pretty much guarantee you'll be carrying decent stock. I mean, they sell in a number of sites around the North Island. Right. So it's a right. So it's not just a little company that's just for Cambridge. They can no. shift the stock to all right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, thanks Kelly for your submission. Uh, very topical at the moment, of course, uh, coming up to November. And uh, yeah, we'll be, as I uh, said earlier, we'll be doing our deliberations this afternoon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for your time, everybody. Okay, and now I'd like to welcome Tom. Tom Davies to the, to the chair. Tom is here with his... Uh, Submission again, Tom, we've had uh, the opportunity to read this in advance, but uh, if you'd like to highlight the main points and we may have some questions for you at the end. Thank you, Liz. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity that we all have to submit to council. Um, and my concern on this occasion was that the prohibition on parking on berm seemed to be a bit inflexible. Subsequently, I've read um, what the council staff say, and I've looked at the um, at the draft bylaw, and I'm happy with what's in there. So, really, I have nothing more to say than that. Um, but I do really appreciate the opportunity that council gives us all to come and submit on these issues. Thank you, Tom. Are there any questions? No. Well, it's, look, it sounds to me like you're you're happy with what uh, you've read, yes. um, and yeah, and and look, and I guess the acknowledgement um, of this process, uh, well, your acknowledgement of it is uh, is well received as well. So you know, obviously, this is a review. We want to make sure it's current. We want to make sure that we're moving with the times. Uh, and if there's anything that does need to change for WIPA, then this is the opportunity that people can uh, can use and to engage with us as well. So yeah, thank you for your submission. It was um, oh, yeah pleasing yeah, to see that you're overall pretty happy with everything. So that's good. <laughs> thank you, Tom. All right, we do have uh, Ange Holt from the Tiamudu Kiki Community Board. Morning, Ange. Nice to have you here. So we've got your um, your submission as well from the Te uh, Kiki Community Board. So it has been pre-read. So if you want to, yeah, just look through the highlights. Yep. Um, so first up, I did just want to acknowledge the work that staff have done um, in answering and making some little recommendations along the way. Um, so there were just a few things I wanted to uh, just touch on. So one of the things we talked about was just in regard to the, the signs. Um, I see that there was um, work done in 2018 in regard to the signs 
in saying that they were all about that size. But from my recollection, the size has been the same for quite a while. So businesses are probably likely to have signs that are compliant rather than having a whole lot of signs that aren't. But if the wind having it a little bit bigger makes it knock over easier, well, then that's the way it is. Um, I also did want to revisit the point we made in regard to um, us as, as council community board um, complying with our own regulations. Um, so I understand that there are times where it's appropriate to have a bigger, brighter sign in places, but I, I just tend to think, and I just want to reiterate this, that it is a bit hypocritical of us when we're telling everyone else, you're allowed this little one meter by one meter sign, and we're allowed a great big um, meter and a half or sort of 1400 by 1400 sign that's sitting there for a long time. I get it while, the, while we're doing a promotion or if it's an emergency event or a redirection for traffic because of works being done in the space. But um, as much as I, I love the Ahuaki information sign down there, I, that probably was what caught my eye. I just sort of find that it's a little bit hypocritical of us. So I just wanted to stress that point. Um, I just want to double check I haven't missed anything that I wanted to mention and those little post-it notes want to sit on top of each other mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to acknowledge and thank the staff for clarifying the signage rule to highlight the district planned rules for signs because I don't know whether I'm a doingy but I got kind of muddled up with what was the public um, bylaw plans in regard to places bylaw signage rules and then with the district plans and I kind of got a bit muddled you know like when you're talking about veranda signs and things like that so that was where when we were discussing it we felt oh, well if there was that consistency but at least if there's that clarity in those signage um, issues that's really helpful so thank you again for that um, definitely support the loading zones and emergency parking um, U-turn, I did just want to highlight that, um, having been out at the Space Centre on a number of occasions, witnessed myself multiple times, and especially with the new Tiara Rimu cycleway going in right past that space, it, how someone hasn't been seriously injured on that corner is beyond me. I have witnessed with my own eyes a fire engine coming around that corner um, while someone did a U-turn right in front of them. And it was just lucky that there was no one parked along that piece of road so that the fire engine was able to go in the parking spaces and miss. And um, as you know, Dave's out there on the other side uh, and he's made the comment that just the number of near misses he sees on a weekly basis. So I just hope that that will be taken into consideration when they're doing the new pathway along there and how that's going to work. Um, I understand that the, the new playground hasn't prevented people from driving on the reserve. They still just drive further down and go and park down the bottom and have their picnics still anyway. So that's a wee by the by. Um, park access areas for path use. Yeah, just with that bylaw, we were definitely trying to discourage people parking across footpaths, um, but can see that you know, there's times when the booms are helpful. I think what Kelly had to say about fireworks and their idea, I just wanted to throw in there that um, that idea of doing a light and sound show, that sounds fabulous, those alternatives to events. So for example, like we had the light party here, how popular that was as an alternative to Halloween. So they really do work well if they're done properly. So congratulations to them on that great idea. And I hope it's an awesome event with fine weather. Um, our really big one was, of course, the cruising bylaw. So we're stoked to see that um, that's going to be included. Um, I see in the recommendation it said that there's going to be a guidance note to explain the definition of cruising. So um, I think, and as a community board, we um, felt that the Christchurch uh, City Council did a really good job of that. Um, so thank you for for adding that in because I believe we can use this as an education um, opportunity as well for these young people so that they understand why what they're doing isn't right. And, and if it's nice and clear that they can understand. Um, I know when I read the 
existing one, I sort of went, well, what exactly is that saying? Um, and I think that pretty much is, is the main thing, but yeah, we're definitely, the cruising um, is a big one for us to support our communities out in the country. I see every time that, you know, you drive down through uh, to Patararu, there's generally um, a fairly extensive amount of rubber left on the road at that intersection not far before there, and, you know, the amount of damage that they're doing, it must be um, Brian and the transportation team's nightmare with the number of signs that get pushed over, chopped over, you know, and just completely messed up. So um, let's hope that that cruising and, um, and the addition of the, I've forgotten the other part specifically, but um, congregating really gives us a little bit of ammunition to help sort that out across the district, not just on this side. So that's pretty much me. So thank you. Um, Thanks for the opportunity, as always, and uh, hope you guys have a good rest of the day. Ka kite anō. Thank you, Ange. Appreciate that uh, submission. Um, good, good points in that uh, in in, uh, in your submission as well. I might add. Are there any questions from the uh, members around the table? No, very straightforward. Hey, and we're going to be moving into deliberations uh, very shortly as well, Ange. So some of the things that you've mentioned may be uh, highlighted as well. All right, thanks, Ange. Okay, everybody. Hey, what we'll um, do now, we will go straight into deliberations. We have no other um, people to speak. Is if we work through Appendix 2, uh, Graham has got the, uh, the summary of submissions with staff comments and recommendations. So we'll just work through category by category. Graham, are you okay with that? Um, I am. I see Brian is just joining me. Um, Brian. For those online, this is Brian Hudson, Transportation Manager, just joining me here. Uh, yes. Diana Aquilina, our legal counsel, is also in the chamber as well. So um, between the three of us, we might actually be able to um, help you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's excellent. Okay, let's, uh, let's kick off with the, uh, the street signs. Okay, the number of um, sub submission points, as you see. Um, the, the main action that we uh, are recommending is the deletion of clause 6.1D. That was um, that reference to the Wi-Fi district plan. So that's just clarifying basically the separation between the district plan rules and the bylaw rules. So I'm removing that that's ambiguity. So um, that's 6.1. In fact, in Appendix 3, if I'm correct, is the draft bylaw, and that should have the track change in. So yep. you, can, you can see are, that one. Are there any questions around the street signs, everybody? Yeah, Mike. Just so asking a clarifying question, really off the back of Angie's question. Um, is there a legal difference between, say, the Ahuaku? Akawaki signs and and the other sign that goes up, she sort of made a point there. So um, one of the aspects of the bylaw, it, it says that you know signs are not permitted over a certain size, and, and but there are exceptions there, and they can be uh, signs that are installed by council for a purpose. And so we install signs for you know water restrictions, uh, road safety education messages and um, events or activities like the getting public um, engagement in the Ahuaki um, process. So when those things happen, that whether it's the water department or the strategy department or others, uh, they would come with their proposal to the transportation department and say, we would like to install these signs and we check it for compliance with the bylaw and suitability as to the safety of the location, uh, the length of time that it's gonna be in place, uh, those sorts of elements, how it's gonna be fixed uh, to make sure it is uh, safe and sensible, sensible. Thanks for that clarification, Brian. So, Roger. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, just in terms of the clarification of signage, this sign bylaw only relates to council owned land, signs on council owned land, so not on private premises. I mean, just as we see the plethora of signs that are coming up, either red, blue, or green, or whatever other color that are appearing on our streets, but they won't fall under 
the controls of this bylaw. This is for public places, yep. not, not private land, that those would, would be district plan, etc. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to the, to the next uh, item, which is loading okay zones. Okay, to delete 6.1. Yeah, I think there's, there is general agreement, yes. Okay, then um, two submission points on the proposal to, well, regarding loading zones and being able to designate for the pickup and set down of passengers, not just goods. Um, our recommendation is that we don't need to make any further changes to the draft bylaw. All right, everyone's agreement with that? Yep, excellent, thank you. Happy with the, uh, the recommendation there. Moving on to emergency vehicles parking. And similarly, we're recommending that we don't require a change to the draft bylaw regarding the designation of emergency vehicle parking spaces. Other, um, those are spaces away from their usual work places. I think that's the correct way of describing it, isn't it, Brian? It's one of yours. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we obviously have these spaces designated, you know, outside fire stations uh, for volunteer fire brigade members to arrive and, and have parking uh, and at police stations for police vehicles. Um, that's not to say that police vehicles can only park in those spaces because we, we see that um, regularly there can be more than uh, more police vehicles outside a police station than the number of spaces that are dedicated for them, but it provides a space um, or two spaces sort of near the front door or in a, in a position for a, a short drop off or a pickup or something like that. So uh, it seems to work quite well and doesn't cause any problems or any, um, we, we haven't certainly had any complaints about the fact that we've uh, made these designations in the past. Thank you, Brian. Okay, everyone's nodding, so that's good. Uh, we're on to the U-turn management. Okay, um, again, our recommendation is that we don't need to make any further changes to the draft of the bylaw, giving um, council the um, authority to designate places where you can't make a U-turn. That's right, and I, and I understand there's no suggested places at this point in time where we might utilise that, but we have the option in the future. Good. Okay. Uh, the cycle path designation. Similarly, again, Brian might be able to describe what this one's about, but, but again, we're proposing no change required to the draft of bylaw based on the submissions received. So, um, everyone's happy this with is that. So, we can designate a cycle path rather than a shared path, is that's my understanding, or, or things like that. So. Sounds like a sensible decision. Sounds good. Okay, the designation of park areas for access. Um, okay, again, we're recommending no change required based on the submission point um, that you have in Appendix 2. Um, just to bear in mind that if we are designating anywhere in a park to, that will enable vehicle access, then um, obviously, there is all the Reserve Act and all those kind of uh, re uh, requirements, and we wouldn't do it without consultation anyway. Thank you. Okay. The footpath use, any queries around that? I think that uh, we'll just keep moving on. Yeah. Graham, if you've got nothing yeah. else. Uh, fireworks. I think there was a little bit of confusion here. So I guess, you know, those who are in mobile traders, there is an, there is a, Kind of R18, you cannot sell fireworks to anyone under the under the age of uh, of 18. So, I think that that we had to clarify that in previous um, changes reviews. Roger. And may I just ask for for clarification here as well, just to be sure that the prohibition on under age sales for traders applies to only mobile traders on council land, doesn't apply to private traders in private property. Uh, this is to do with the, the mobile traders because of the inability to restrict um, under age 
customers to basically the premises where if you're in a shop, then you can you can have an internal door and stop people going through that. You can't do that as a mobile trader. So um, that's the reason it's in there. I understand that and I'm pleased that we've got that clarification. But I mean, the other thing is, it doesn't come into this, but vaping and that kind of thing. So really fireworks falls into a similar kind of compartment to vaping. So we allow vaping shops. So we still got to allow firework shops or shops selling fireworks within our, our uh, district. Yes, so we've been only successful in in the in the mobile trading portion of this, which um, I think, yeah, we will, we, will, we yeah, we, I think we need to continue to work on this one, yeah, uh, because there yeah. always seems to be something new in vaping. I know uh, resonates with a number of us at the moment as well, uh, around the number of shops that we're starting to see. Anyway, it's a conversation other, for another day. The other point that was made as well re regarding the use of fireworks in public spaces. Um, Clause 10 under nuisance, um, that we think that would catch the setting off of fireworks in, say, council reserves, um, because it's any object um, or it's using any item, object or thing recklessly or in a way that might be dangerous or injurious or cause a nuisance to any person in that space. So um, we think if you can actually catch someone doing it, because of course the evidence goes up in smoke, um, but if you, if you can actually catch someone, then we, we think that a nuisance provision of the bylaw would, would be sufficient. Okay, thank you, Graham. Clear. Yeah, so I just want to clarify um, about the selling of fireworks by mobile traders. So at, at the moment, the bylaw says that it must a mobile trader must not provide goods and services that have an R18 restriction. So basically, if they're in a public place, yeah, they can't yeah. be selling fireworks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So we're recommending that we don't need to make any further changes to the the bylaw. Absolutely, yep. Cruising. Brian, would you like to take this one? <laughs> well, I, I guess the, the bylaw uh, clarifies things. It, um, uh, we've probably made it simpler to understand. Um, so we, we have our light uh, vehicle prohibition, uh, which we've done the consultation on earlier in the year, and we um, you know, want to now start well, not so much consultation, we consulted with police and comsafe groups and community boards and, and made a list of those places where we want to implement those light vehicle bans. Uh, so we'll be getting on with that. Um, it, it obviously also makes this bylaw qualifying for the, um, the enforcement of the cruising um, uh, activity, which is you know, described under the Transport Act. So uh, the police can use the bylaw also as an extra um, a mechanism for their antisocial uh, behaviour. So uh, we are, yeah, I guess able to you know get stuck in and now start to make some of these changes. It it doesn't necessarily follow that the police will have more resources and will be able to enforce the bylaw or catch more people. Um, but it does make it easier and the, I guess, the presence of those signs on some of our roads saying that these are areas that um, light vehicles are banned um, may discourage them from hanging out in those places. Thanks, Brian. So look, just so that we're all clear, so we have got, um, you recall, gosh, I'm trying to remember what month it was, but we've had uh, in the past, of course, some grievances around this. So in terms of um, prohibiting people to cruise uh, to, you know, where we've got multiple vehicles who are not going anywhere for a specific purpose, uh, we will be considering roads, specific roads and doing our consultation with those people later this year? That, that's correct. And I guess it's... Um... Under this bylaw, it's a decision of council. It's not a, a consultation exercise. You know, do you want it for your street? It's more of a, so it's an information um, 
to those uh, streets and businesses in those areas rather than a, a, a consultation, do you want it or not? Uh, so the, the evidence has been gathered from um, all of the complaints to council, uh, gathered from the reports to the police uh, and, uh, and, and ComSafe, and then considered in light of can the bylaw sensibly be applied in this location to ban light vehicles. Um, so that has been the, uh, the mechanism to determine these locations. Uh, then there would be information out to businesses and, and residents on those uh, roads to say, you know, this is the plan, council's intending to do this, uh, providing them all the information about how the bylaw works and how it would work, uh, noting that it won't impact, um, it, it shouldn't impact them negatively in any way, it should only be a positive impact in terms of trying to discourage activity, which they themselves have probably, you know, been negatively impacted by in the, in the past. Um, so, yeah, we just... I guess need to be careful if we say consultation it, it makes it sound like um, you, you're going to be able to ask for this in your street and council will put it there and it will have some effect that's not the case it's more a matter of um, locations where we know uh, that this bylaw or this ban can be can be put in place and it can then be implemented by police. Okay, yeah, thank you, Brian, for clarifying that. And I guess once we get a bit closer to the start of that, uh, we'll be able to communicate really clearly about uh, yeah, how and what information or you know what uh, consultation will, will sort of be taking place. But yeah, be very mindful of that word consultation. I appreciate what you've said. Lou. Thank you, Brian. I, I actually put supportive of this in a lot of ways. You've got the word nuisance in there, and I actually have worked a lot at the RSA sit there in the deck quite a lot. You get young people, cars going up and down, up and down, the actual main street, just round and round and round, and often accelerating far too rapidly from each intersection and turning back again. That would allow the local police to actually have something that they could utilise to actually detain that vehicle, pull them over and have a look at where they've got a warrant and everything else and comply. So I'm very, very supportive of this. And I think in those sort of situations, there is a big positive for this, having this little bit of legislation in place. So thank you very much. Monty. Uh, so on the subject of cruising, you've said you're going to reference the Transport Act definition, I think. Uh, just in the tracked change version of the bylaw, I can't find that either in the definition section or 17 anti-social driving. Is that right? Uh, it's in there, so I it, have seen If it. I missed it, yeah. Um, so... Um, Note. Yeah, it's, got, a, it's a guidance note. I've got the guidance so note the in there now. Guidance note, um, appendix three under, under 17.3. Yeah, 17.3. So it's quite a large guidance note. Oh, okay. Up. Not in our version. It's not. So you, you've got a more up to date version than me. Right. Cool. Should be exactly the same version. Should be exactly the same version. So, um, have you got a page number? It's page 16. 16 of 24 of the bylaw. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have a grey box on that page. I um, wonder if that was something in 16 out of 24. Yeah, that's right. So, okay, that's possibly something in the rendering. But if it's in there and you're sure it's in there, that's good. I can. Yeah. We will make sure. <laughs> We can distribute a copy after. Yeah. yeah, let's do that. Let's do that, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, if we move on then to stock droving. Okay, this, there is a... Um, Out drafting, of darkness, yes. There is a drafting change. Um, we have no stock drovers, stock, stock droving experts on the team. So thanks to the submitter who mentioned this, that... Um, the time period be, um, shouldn't be driving cattle across the road any period of time between the hours of darkness. The request was to, we've put in except with council approval. So uh, we've just added that uh, degree of uh, uh, flexibility. So, um, yeah, Monte. Yeah, I think this came from um, Cambridge Community Board, I believe. Um, and first time I'd read the bylaw, I, I thought it was fine that you don't do this at night, but I accept the point that there might be circumstances in which you want to, and it is safe, and therefore I, I thought this was a, a, a good 
relief valve, as it were, to give council the discretion. So I was happy. Thanks, Monty. Makes sense. Thank you. Seeing lots of nodding around the room. That's good. Okay, parking on berms. Now, this was our most hot topic, probably. Just to uh, so let's uh, <laughs> um, let you introduce that, Graham. We're not actually recommending a change here, but I'll let Brian talk to it because it was a bit of a hot topic. So, yes, yeah, so, and I guess it is the, um, uh, the the sort of conflicting situation where we the bylaw has always said that it's illegal to park on grass berms and gardens and footpaths and things like that. Uh, but the public generally see that it happens. Um, so there are, you know, streets um, around which actually don't have a curb. They've just got a grass edge and people regularly pull off and park on the grass. And that works fine and council doesn't do any enforcement. And uh, so that is, is the case. But um, uh, what we find is that we end up needing to do enforcement where we have complaints that people are um, regularly parking on berms and making a big mess, so turning them into mud, so quite inconsiderate, or they're parking up on berms, you know, really close to people's driveways, and so uh, they can't see when they're coming out of their driveway, uh, that they park on berms and the nose of the car is now covering half the footpath and blocking the footpath, so we get, you know, disabled people in, on mobility scooters and others complaining. So in all of those situations, uh, we do... Um, do enforcement action. Uh, another common one, so people will bounce up over the curb and channel, so there's no you know, place to, dr uh, to drive into a driveway or anything, so they just drive up over the curb and then uh, all park on the grass and that eventually damages the curbs and um, you know, breaks down the roading infrastructure. So those are all situations where we do enforcement. So it's, it's really creating a nuisance, a hazard or doing damage. Um, but in other locations where it can happen and is not causing any harm, then we're, we're not um, enforcing those situations. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we've got Marcus, Monty, and then Roger. So, uh, yeah, a few people have been talking about it, and I've got some examples as well, but I just want some clarification around. Does this give us more teeth around people who clog up with rubbish and hoarding on booms? Because I logged a job with Intino yeah. this week, um, on Hazelmead Crescent, um, there's now large panes of glass on the side of Hazelmead Crescent, and that's quite narrow on the footpath. And so I logged a job with Antino and, and think is because all, yeah. all, the hundreds of intermediate kids running there, someone's going to get pushed into the glass and blah, blah. So does this give us more teeth to be able to actually proactively do something about that? Y yes, indeed. I mean, if they're parking a vehicle there, and, and blocking the berm and doing damage and things like that, then, then that um, clause is used. Uh, but if they're creating an obstruction, so there's other, and nuisance, then there's other clauses in the bylaw also. And so in, in that situation, council has to issue a notice to the person, um, either you know, hand it to them or fix it to their property, saying that they're causing an obstruction. Uh, we generally give them a, a little bit of time to remove that obstruction, but if they don't, then we can remove it and send them the bill for that. So that, that's the, um, the mechanism that we have used in the past at that property and we'll use again. It, it doesn't, it just seems to go on for a, a while. And I'm wondering, is it because we don't have enough teeth in our bylaw to actively manage that? Because like the glass is still, and, there's, and there's other examples that I've got around the district, but we'll just focus on this one because like the glass and, and rubbish and stuff is still there. And I logged it on, um, when did I log yeah, it? Yeah, I understand. And, and, and Marcus, so it's just, it's just yeah, a little bit yeah. frustrating that, that, you know, there's this potential big hazard there that, 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 that we don't seem to be um, thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I guess when, when the calls come in, so staff do attend um, straight away to see, you know, what's the degree of the hazard. And, and it, of course, it changes day to day at that location. Um, but it, I guess for reasons of, of privacy and um, other matters, it, I, I'd probably prefer to give you more information about that particular situation outside the meeting. And, and the other thing that I've got... Um, with motor home, people with motor homes and stuff parking on the berms, um, if the neighbours don't object and if it's not obstructing the footpath, like it's just a, just a grass berm, we don't have any problems with that, but we've got the tools that if it is causing issue for neighbours and stuff that we can. That's correct, that. yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, Monty. Uh, yeah, berms, I just thought it was worth pausing on this for a minute. 
Um, in the staff commentary to the submissions, it says um, we've always had the ability to control inappropriate parking on berms, and so we're clarifying that. And then I read the bylaw, and I just wonder if we've quite done enough because it now clearly prohibits parking on berms, except where such areas are designed and laid out to accommodate the parking of vehicles. It's still quite ambiguous, and, and you immediately think of all the berms adjacent to our sports fields that are routinely parked on all winter. And I suspect, Brian, you'd say that was all right until they're making mud, at which point it's not. Maybe because it's it's you know it's it's at that point become inappropriate to use common sense language, but in the bylaw, we're talking about areas that are designed and laid out. Yeah. yeah. Now, just a mown berm probably is neither designed nor laid out, but clearly, usage look makes it look alright until it gets muddy. I I just wonder if we've done enough to be prescriptive enough to give the clarity that you're seeking in the bylaw. Yeah, I, I guess it's difficult to write a bylaw that's going to cover every case, uh, but that um, designed for um, parking, and I can think of there, there are examples. So where uh, underneath the grass there is, you know, a bed of metal and sand designed to drain and be strong enough for parking on it. Uh, we have got some areas uh, uh, in subdivisions in Cambridge where it looks like a grass berm, but it's got those um, concrete blocks underneath with the topsoil and the grass growing through it. And we've got some of that in some of our parks as well. Um, so that, I guess, would be examples of where it's designed. But I, I guess, you know, I, I certainly understand that we've, we've got a bylaw here that says you shouldn't do it. And at times we're, we're enforcing it. And at other times we're not enforcing it. Um, but I guess the same applies to our just our parking time limits. Um, you know, they're there all the time but we haven't always got enforcement staff and we don't you know, enforce on weekends and things like that when there's no staff. So we'll, I guess we'll always have this situation where we've got to um, yeah, uh, use that enforcement staff to tackle the problems that are, the, the issues that are causing problems for our residents or for road safety um, or, or for asset damage. Can, can I just challenge that? I think it's significantly different to parking. Parking is clearly regulated. If people choose to obey it, comply or not, and then you have an enforcement question. When you've got mown grass beside a sports field, and I look at it and go, can I park there? Can I park, not park there? I don't know. Right. I always think that is bad law if you don't know, and enforcement may or may not be taken, and the perpetrator can justifiably say, I simply didn't know, it was not clear. So that's, yeah, that's okay. just my challenge yeah. in that, that, no. that clause. Okay. You're right, it is, it is a challenge. And we often give warnings, you know, the enforcement team will give warnings first and say, actually what you're doing is not good for these reasons uh, before we start issuing tickets. Uh, so we are certainly mindful of that because it's not always evident. Um, but uh, I would hope that 99.9% .9 of the time, if people get a ticket for parking on a berm, they probably realise that they're doing something which is silly and, um, and uh, are causing a nuisance and everything. So uh, I, I would like to think that we're actually really fair and reasonable about how we do this. So I guess, Monty, have you got some suggested changes that you feel would strengthen that? Or are you happy with the, with the reply? No, I don't. I just wanted to test it. You're making a law here. Yeah. When you make laws, they've got to be really clear. And I, I think it's important you don't mix up the law with the enforcement, like they're separate things. So, look, I don't. I just read it. And I went, well, you could drive a truck <laughs> through that. Um, but so we're kind of operating on common sense, which kind of works for me. And you can adjust this later on if it's not working each time this comes up. So I was happy enough. I just wanted to test it with the group, see if what we thought. Any other comments on this particular issue? Claire? Yeah, I mean, you make good points, Monty. I mean, I issue. actually like the approach, um, you know, that Brian's outlined because, you know, when you don't know the law, when there's ambiguity and you think, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? I don't want to get my hand smacked or penalised. But because the penalty actually the first time around you know, isn't going to be serious. It'll be a warning. You'd have a conversation with people or something. And it's probably only if it's a persistent offender or something. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with that. And knowing that, you know, we don't actually have great resourcing for enforcement and things like that. And I think our 
a community don't actually want to live in a police state either. Yeah, I, I, I do really support this common sense approach. Okay, thanks, Claire. Roger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, Brian, I must uh, say I've got a little bit of a concern about the future with high density parking. Now, I went to the opening of um, Patrick Hogan Retirement Village, what a good name, and that's on Hugo Shaw Drive. Now, that's a feeder going right up to C1. It's a good example of high density housing actually fronting onto the street. The street is particularly narrow, like it's even got narrowing chicanes that go down to one vehicle width. We're not seeing it yet because that's not populated. You know, the houses aren't uh, populated yet, but I think it will become a challenge because all of those houses have only got single car garaging and minimal driveway. And so people are going to be looking to park on the street. Now, if they park on the street, then they'll really restrict the amount of space on the street. So really there will be parking on the berm. And I'm just thinking that this obviously doesn't allow that. So we know that on our future developments that I've got a high density requirement on them, it's going to present a challenge. Um, I just think that this is not recognizing that. I don't know what the solution is. Over to you. Walking further. It's probably walking further is uh, is probably the solution because you're quite correct. Where if we're we are we are certainly encouraging um, people to not park on our berms. Yeah. So they if that's not an option to them, then they will have to park somewhere else. So the question is, where is that somewhere else? Well, Brian, did you want to respond? Uh, so Hugo Shaw Drive is is one of those roads into the development which is purposely uh, designed to be quite narrow to. Um, to make speed slow. Um, and it's with the knowledge that the main collector road, um, which will join the roundabout, is the road that we want the majority, the vast majority of traffic to be using, which is wide and it has some uh, indented parking bays along it and everything and bus stops. So though, yeah, those smaller roads will be quite narrow uh, because they are designed to be those people-friendly spaces. And the whole subdivision is actually part of the structure plan, the development was to encourage people to walk and cycle. So they've got big wide um, uh, cycle paths on each uh, road. And uh, you can probably cycle quite safely on the road if you want to stay on the road. Um, and the, yeah, the, as I say, the, the design ethos was that if you're going to visit a friend or to the shop or the park or something, you would walk or, or bike or something like that, as opposed to get in your car and drive there because uh, the roads lend themselves to those other modes more than they do to just uh, constant car travel. I can understand the philosophy there, but practically, I mean, that Ryman retirement village is a community of a certain age. And I would imagine that the majority of visitors to those houses, friends, are going to be of a similar age. I can't actually imagine them on bikes and walking. No, they, they do have quite a bit of parking within their development. Uh, they always do um, at their, their main centre and around the units as well. So a um, certain number of visitors can you know, obviously drive and park quite close to where they're going. All right, thanks, Brian. Lou. I'll just add a little bit to Councillor Gordon's uh, comments. Um, we were in Europe for quite a period of time, and while I was there, they actually had high density housing, particularly in Amsterdam, but they had parking, designated parking areas, quite away sometimes from their location. They utilised either mobility, uh, electric mobility scooters or cycles to get to their car, and then they did their external mm -hmm. work. The one thing where you're talking about location, don't forget the advent of all the people using mobility scooters and, and you know, urban mobility. A lot of people, these modern scooters now are very, very efficient. And we, we actually have 16 of them operating within the RSA. And some of them have a significant amount of range now. 
they can be parked in a very limited area. Well, they need to be parked on site because they need to be charged. This is the sort of future that I think we've got to promote. Um, unfortunately, we can't limit or open up the car parking because we've got a national policy statement as far as parking is concerned. So I think we've just got to work with the facilitator to allow. And that's really my thought on that. I, Thank I you, Lou. Problem solved. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, no, no. Thanks for those comments. You're quite right. Okay, everybody, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up now if there's nothing else. We've got other issues. Was there anything in the other issues anyone wanted to raise? No? Okay. Oh, clear. The issue I wanted to raise isn't anything to do with the submissions, but Tom Davies mentioned the instability of the website. I was really concerned about that because there might have been other people trying to make submissions that we never heard of. I've never I've never had reports of there being a problem with the website for submitting, um, you know, our, our, I don't know, for people to get their submissions in. It's like, was there an issue or is, is there any concerns we should have with, with the way we, we've got this set up? Graham, do you, can you answer that one? Um, I can't answer that one. I'll ask our communications and engagement team to um, have a look into that, see if they can, they can identify anything that might have happened there, um, unless Lisa, you've got anything that you happen to know that can help. Unfortunately, this consultation predates me, but I'm certainly not aware of any issues with the website in that space, but I'll double check with the team. Just we need to have it completely robust and not to, to be creating difficulties for people, eh? Yeah. Absolutely. No, no barriers. Absolutely not. Okay, we'll head Marcus and then um, Dale Marie. Just wondering, did you get good feedback from the real estate agents and stuff about the signs? Like, are they are they happy about um, things? Like the, I know you reported at the Chamber of Commerce and stuff like that. Did you get good feedback from the real estate agents? You've seen all the feedback we've got, so there wasn't any. Okay, Dan Marie. Just a quick comment in regards to that submission. Um, my husband bought a new device couple of weeks ago he went to put in a submission to something totally different because he hadn't set up the um, settings properly it was a bit like when I signed up here I couldn't get into diligent because I wouldn't my phone wouldn't allow the diligent thing to get to here to allow it to happen so sometimes um, us as submitters have to check our own settings that could be preventing us from engaging more within the submission process. So I found me and my husband, actually it was a little bit of an operator problem with our own devices. And I'm not saying that about our submitter, but it just might be that it might be a, your own device problem as opposed to the, the council problem. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. Still need to get yes, technology. Sure. Technology gets us all at some point or another. I'm, I'm quite confident of that. <laughs> okay. Right. Hey, look, I think if, if there are no other um, discussion points on any submissions, we've got a recommendation. Yep, we've got an amendment. Uh, Diane is going to let us know what that amendment is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, sorry, I can't share my screen um, due to technical difficulties, but just because we had the um, different versions um, with that guidance night that referred to with the cruising um, clause, anti-cruising clause, just uh, suggest amended recommendation D, which says, um, recommends that council adopt the public places bylaw post consultation draft, subject to the following amendments following determination under C, which is adding an additional guidance note after clause 17.3 to explain relevant definitions and requirements relating to clause 17, antisocial driving just to ensure that that's covered off. Excellent, thank you for that. So we know that that is definitely included. Excellent, okay, everybody. Um, so we've got, uh, with, that, uh, with that noted change, we've got recommendation on page 16, A, B, C, and D. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? I'll, I'll move, please. Hang on, just hang on. Just Sorry, hang on, Philip, I'm just doing something else. Just hold on, hang on. Yeah. Okay, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to consider um, B, which is whether we're going to um, accept the receipt of a late submission. I have no issue with that, so I think we're going to 
treat that separately. So Andrew and Monty, all in favour? Okay, thank you. Right now we'll go back to the uh, the rest of the recommendation. Apologies, everybody. So we'll go back and, uh, but Philip, I think, are you wanting to move the recommendation? Yes, please. I'll, no. I'll move the recommendation. Thank you. The remaining recommend yeah, numbers, no problem at all. And I see Claire is willing to second. So all in favour? Against? Aye. Carried. Lovely, everybody. Thank you. That is uh, the public places bylaw review done and dusted for well, thank you. We'll a wee bring, while. We'll bring it back to council on the 26th for um, formal adoption. Formal adoption, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to everybody involved with this and to all the submitters as well. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Um, we have just uh, one more item before morning tea, and that is our long-term plan work program update. Good morning, ladies. This should be a very straightforward item, I believe. Hey, good morning, everyone. So I will take the report as read, but I just will highlight um, a few uh, matters that are coming up. Uh, we're really approaching a busy time with the LTP project with only three months until the adoption of the consultation document and the supporting document. So there's a lot to get done before then. Um, we've got the first cut of the budget coming together. Um, you had the overview of the capital project, capital program last month, which will set the scene for um, the 9th of October full day workshop we've got, where you'll get a first glance at the operational and capital budget. Um, the draft infrastructure strategy is has been developed and is being reviewed by staff, and you'll get to see that at a workshop on the 26th of September. And that workshop day will also include the development contributions policy. And just finally, the financial strategy and the funding and financial policies are progressing well, and there'll be a first workshop on those at the end of October. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone's got on the project. Thank you. Monty first, then Lou. Uh, yeah, just a question about um, budgeting process. Under in box five, the last sentence is that a final LTP budget is scheduled for adoption by council on 12 December. Can you explain what that means to me? So you'll get, uh, we've got a workshop uh, October, November and with to show you the full budget. And so there'll be a couple of iterations Then that final budget will come back for adoption in December. Uh, actually, I think it's being adopted into November, but it will be adopted in December for auditing. So that's when audit will come in and go through it with a fine tooth comb. So how can you adopt a budget yes. six months before you adopt a plan when the budget is the plan? Yes. So, yeah, it is the plan. So along with that budget will, will be all the um, collateral, so the consultation documents, supporting documents, which will show all the projects and programs that make up that budget. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a slow process. So the audit will take place from end of January, February. Um, then it will be brought back to you in March for adoption for consultation. And then consultation, March, April, okay. hearings to lives. So that, the final plan that, that genuinely means that things are done deal by 12 December, basically. Okay, I didn't realize that. Rookie mistake, thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I just... Andrew. Yeah. So we're adopting the budget principles, I guess, and, and the bulk of that budget, but it, it still can be amended. And so the final budget or plan, if you like, actually doesn't occur until June or next year. Yeah. So, you know, can I, can sorry, made. can I just jump in there? Um, okay, Melissa, and then back to Monty. Yeah. So we need to adopt something for auditing purposes. So it's essentially drawing a line in the sand, um, acknowledging that that's the last point that we can adopt something before audit come in. There will be opportunities to make um, amendments prior to consultation, but we really wanna um, have a pretty fair idea of what we're proceeding with because it does need to go through that robust audit process. And there's the ability to amend after consultation yes. as well, yep. otherwise it's a point of consultation. So. At that point, you wouldn't wanna be making significant changes post either the 12th or post 
um, leading into consultation. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that. Mm. But perhaps, but perhaps, some, just in hindsight, um, perhaps it should have read the final draft yeah. LTP budget. I think that would have been better for clarification. And I'm assuming then you wouldn't want significant deviations from the budget because otherwise it would have to be reaudited, right? Yeah. Those points. Yeah. Specifically. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Sorry. No, no, no. I am absolutely good clarification. Any other questions? Uh, Claire. Yeah, thanks. Um, the question I have is about stormwater. I suppose it's the activity management plans and it's listed on page 82 of our agenda or page four of the report. So I'm really uncomfortable that we have all those activity management plans, but further down at the 13th of June elected members workshop, we agreed that we'd only review level of service um, services um, for that list there that doesn't include stormwater. So I'm just picking on that because I think in, in response to you know, our climate change um, challenges, stormwater is probably really at the pointy end. And why would we be making a 10 year plan without reviewing the level of service for stormwater? And I guess connected with that is the fact that there's no mention in this whole strategy about about how we're going to address climate change challenges in general. Now, I know that we've agreed that we're going to set up a subcommittee, which doesn't have a time frame, hasn't been set up yet, doesn't have any program of work, you know, connected to it or anything. Yeah, and yet we're meant to be signing off on this program or this strategy. Yeah, so I'm just letting you know I'm pretty uncomfortable about it. Okay, Melissa, did you want to respond? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so acknowledging your points relating to stormwater. So um, we that was not a, a level of service that um, you know, elected members showed any indication in wanting to review. I suspect part of that, um, acknowledging that obviously as part of a affordable waters transition, um, that service will be moving away from council. Um, so I suspect that's why we do have a transition date now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be in council's responsibility for a further 12 months. Um, and then post that, it will obviously not be under our control. So, yeah, I guess that's all I've got to say on that point. Yeah, oh, look, Melissa, this is, this is the million dollar question, right? Yes, we have a date, but is it a firm date? It's not a confirmed date until it actually happens. So I guess this is the, the level of nervousness that um, probably we're, we're all feeling. Claire, did you have something else to on Yes, I mean, on that subject? with this affordable waters reform, I mean, there was always a question of whether stormwater was going to be in or out in the first version of that reform. With the election, that could well be everything's up for grabs again. And in fact, stormwater might not go across. You know, like, we, do, we just don't know. So yeah, I just think it's a really bad space to be in trying to make a long-term plan with such a critical, um, I suppose, activity. Yeah. So. All right, so perhaps we can feed that back to um, that team. Are you happy with that, Claire, if we feed that back? Or do you want to see something? I'd be more comfortable with trying to do some something in there because I, I just think, on the on the face of it, I don't I don't think stormwater would go across if there was a reform because it's a lot easier just to do, do drinking water and wastewater. Stormwater was always extremely contentious. Um, Kirsty, um, through you, Madam Chair, the PSG for um, the LTP project meets weekly. We are currently looking at how we treat um, three waters, affordable waters. Um, in response to the transition period and how we um, incorporate that into the long-term plan. Um, we will take this feedback from elected members about the level of service review and treatment of stormwater and um, incorporate that into that wider discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, now we've got a little bit of a backlog. So we're gonna to go to Roger and then we're gonna to go to Bill. Yeah. Good, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this. I just want to register a little bit of a concern that I have, particularly in the timing that I'm seeing within this document, we have an important group project for Cambridge, which is Cambridge Connections. That is going to come out with 
a number of statements and strategies that are going to be the future for the Cambridge transport network. And I'm sure that there will be from that some uh, management business plans that may eventuate. I'm trying not to presume what that group is going to come out with, but I am concerned that whatever it does come out with is going to be too late for inclusion in the long-term plan. And that really is a concern for me because that Cambridge Connections is not coming back to us uh, until the end of the year. Through you, Madam Chair, um, I guess we have always proceeded with this RTP on the basis that we are aware that Cambridge Connection, um, where it's at in its phasing. Um, I guess we, having that awareness, we are primed to respond. Um, at, at, I'm not entirely sure over the limitations on that, but it is always something that we um, know might be needed to be added in um, later on. Thank you. I just wanted to register my concern and I'm pleased to hear that, that you are aware and that there would be still opportunity for incorporation of whatever it comes out with. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Bill. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm just wanting to check, and, and my apologies, I haven't been at the table for some time yet, but um, there's nothing in the long-term plan proposal here about the, the rule change for Papakainga, uh, which is a priority for Māori. Can you explain to me why it's not in here? Um, is, is, is it separated from the long-term plan? Um, or is um, there is it's addressed in terms of ahuaki, but surely um, it was work, it's, it's separated work of the council, in my understanding. And I just wanted to know why it's not been referenced here. Mm. So through you, Madam Chair, public hiring is addressed under the district plan. Um, so uh, plan controlling activities of land use on the ground. Um, this is more around council's strategic plan over the next 10 years um, and essentially the budget to support that. So they're controlled through, um, Papakainga is controlled through the district plan. Okay. But to still have a question about it is that um, obviously where um, Papakainga are determined to be put into place. And I, I, sorry, I thank, thank you, Claire, for that. Um, but um, there will be infrastructure costs to that. Um, are we not considering that? It's only going to be considered in the district plan and not in the long-term plan? Is there a disconnect? I, I just want to, I want an assurance that there's no disconnect going on. Um, so maybe Kirsty. I will let, we'll let Kirsty take it. I guess my only caution is that it is going through a, a, a process. And of course, we are not going to be, um, you know, preempting any outcome at this point in time. We're keeping our minds open. Um, and yeah, so I'll pass over to Kirsty. Um, through you, Madam Chair. So the Ahuaki is still under development, and that um, obviously has um, key themes um, growth in housing. Um, Papakainga um, is incorporated within that, so that will provide overall strategic direction to the organisation. As, as the chairperson Liz mentioned, um, that plan change is still underway. Um, we haven't entered into a public notification um, consultation process. This is a high level, um, this is the project plan and providing updates on the component parts of the long-term plan. So our strategies, policies, um, and um, the budgeting process, sitting at a lower level is then the projects and initiatives that will be put forward into the long-term plan um, with specific infrastructural community services projects and initiatives. So that detail is not in here. This is merely an update um, advising you of what is on track, um, potentially what becomes off track as we are progressing the development of the long-term plan. Absolutely, um, we are working to be strategy-led and to ensure that all of our processes are in alignment across our organisation and business. Okay, um, Mike? Uh, thank you to the Chair. Just picking up on Roger's point there, can, can I just, and I know the Cambridge Connections timeframe is late December, but 
Yeah, I also feel really uncomfortable with Tommy. Why is it late December? Why is it after this date? And I guess why can't it be brought forward by a couple of weeks? Because I'm figuring it could be reasonably significant. Why can't we bring the program forward by whatever date it takes for us to meet before the 12th and consider whatever it comes out with? <clears throat> because picking up on Monty's point, I mean, you can't deviate from this too much because it really it has an impact on either service or rates. And so if you go out with a draft, it needs to be sort of within QE, or at least it always, I think, pretty much has been. So just see, why can't we bring this forward? Is there an outside reason or is it, yeah. I'll let Claire and then Roger. Yeah, I was looking for some staff who are part of the project group. I mean, my understanding is we're waiting on third parties um, to do uh, technical analysis work, the modeling of it, and that's been delayed. And so our hands are tied there. But, but well, hang on. Really good so why are our hands tied? Oh, well, because we rely on their expertise to provide us with the information. So why aren't we giving them... Uh, so I'm not talking to you, Claire, but someone, my question is not for today then, but I'd like it brought back. Why can't we give some of the hurry up to fit in with this yeah. time frame? Um, the other thing is, though, someone from finance might be able to advise whether or not there are um, placeholder um, budget allocations already in the long-term plan for the Cambridge Connection um, sort of outcomes which were and probably anticipated. I suspect that there are already um, quite um, generous budget allocations in there. Yeah, uh, Kirsty, and then Roger. Um, through you, Madam Chair, Councillor Clear is correct in terms of the traffic modelling work that is, is um, being um, undertaken and updated and there has been delay with that. With regard to placeholders, we will take an action from this to report back to you as to whether, um, as, as we mentioned, and you're aware, business cases have been prepared, a number of projects and initiatives, and we will clarify whether anything that potentially is within the ambit of Cambridge Connections is, is included as a placeholder. We'll report that back to you. Thanks very much for that, Kirsty. All right. Uh, anyone else? Oh, Roger, uh, you want no, to push I think it off? Yeah. Claire just... Um, did mention the external agency and the fact that we're waiting for the WRTM remodeling to come through to support the um, Waka Kotahi fundamental case that's built into Cambridge Connections. I agree with you. Putting pressure on would be, you know, I think if we could, then that would be beneficial. Okay, thank you, Roger. Okay, I think the uh, yeah the message has gone through. All right. Um, is there any any other questions on this item? Otherwise, we'll close it off. We'll break for morning tea, and we will uh, resume our agenda ten forty five. Everyone happy with that? Thanks. Oh, we need a mover and a seconder actually before we do that. To thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Monty. All in favour? Carried.
the dam B, you know, the dam that burst through the, uh, the last heavy rains some months ago. So this was, this was Peter Finlay's property. He's, he's, he doesn't own it any longer, but Susan was contacted by media yesterday. So I'm just going to get her to do give a briefing of where things are at. Uh, thanks, Liz. Hey, um, yeah, so um, obviously um, there's quite a prolonged history to this piece of um, land in terms of the flood hazard challenges. It's, it dates back to the 50s kind of thing, so it's not just something that arrived yesterday. But um, long and short of it is that there were a number of reports produced from about 2013, 2014 through to 2018 it was pretty clear that there needed to be some urgent remedial work done. Agreement couldn't eventually be reached with Peter Finlay to enable staff to actually go in and undertake that work because we're responsible for it, although we don't own the dam. Um, it's pretty clear from the um, documents that, um, um, that it was uh, recommended it be done in the summer of 2018-19 for whatever reasons wasn't, we allocated significant funding to the tune of 1.59 million, I think, in our LTP for year 2021 to, to do a bigger fix, but the remedial work still remained outstanding. So anyway, June or July, the rains came and it, and it um, topped over and um, Exeter Street experienced a little bit of flooding. Um, off the back of that, a Lagoima request was received from um, stuff um, with the information in respect of this matter and all that information was avail made available to them just recently and I had a phone call yesterday from Jonah Frank Bowell um, asking for an interview. Essentially we've, we have nowhere to go on it um, and the article is now on the front page of the um, like the Times I believe. My sense is that this probably won't be the last time we see this matter raised in, in, the, in the media um, because although I think we came off quite well in general terms from that article, notwithstanding the position that we're in, um, I, my feeling is that um, Mr Finlay won't be content with leaving it there because he's kind of painted quite poorly in terms of that article. So just sort of give you the heads up that that's where we're at with it. Um, and the reason why it's reared its head now is because of that Lagoima request we received um, from staff, um, which has obviously just recently been made available to them. So watch this space. I'm kind of, I'm actually just for forewarning now that Gary's here, I'm going to ask for a clear a clarity around what's been done since. Because of course there was a change of ownership of the property in 2022. Um, and I want to get a clearer picture around um, um, what steps we're taking now in terms of um, the issues or risks in re regards to that bond and the other one, because they're both um, quite neglected it seems pretty clear from that, those reports. So just giving you a heads up around that. That's why you'll see it on the paper. Yeah, so um, Barry Bergen and co, they've been trying to work with, um, this is all public exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> so they've been trying to work with um, uh, Peter Finley for some time. And there's, there was some modeling done to indicate that uh, this council didn't see a need for those uh, ponds. Uh, Hamilton City took a contrary view. Um, but at the same time, Finley was trying to do his development. And so he's always been after compensation for those dams. Um, historically, Waipa County constructed those dams. Mm -hmm. I think it was mid to late 80s. But the, the ownership was never formalized in any way. Um, so as I, as I recall it, um, the council did lots of work on the Alderton farm by way of races and fencing and those sorts of things and, and compensation for allowing the Rookie block to drain through those ponds, but nothing was ever formalised by the engineers at the time. And since then, we just struggled to work with Peter Finlay to get um, compensation arrangement sorted, how it can work with this new development, and we even had to get a formal legal agreement so we could go in there and do the investigations and testing. But we've never managed to work confidently with Finlay to get the thing resolved. So now Port has owned that land, and I understand the development engineers have been working very closely with them, but I'll give an update on just where things are.
just ask a couple of questions. So by the sound of it, there was a question as to whether or not they were vested in why Pa District Council even had any ownership. Because something that struck me is why were those engineering reports done, clearly saying the work needed to be done without delay and no budget set for it? Because that's the way the article reads. Even those, those reports well predate the 2021 LTP. The only time any money is mentioned is in that LTP. So surely some budget should have been allocated or perhaps it could have been done with an existing budget so it, there wasn't a special budgeting line for it. Yeah, I don't know, because that's what looks really bad, I, I thought. Yes, so Claire, I'd have to go back and investigate a, a timeline, but my understanding was that um, Barry Bergen and crew identified from our perspective that the dams weren't required, and so they were going to work with Finlay as he did his developments to create, you know, wetlands and things of that nature. So there was a supposition that those those ponds weren't required, um, but then it became apparent that you know. Finley and his development never happened. And so that's when bite the bullet, put 1.7 million in the budget and get the thing done. Mm, okay. Just, just for sake of clarity, the actual remediation work that was proposed has a value in one of the, um, the documents of, of 60,000. So it wasn't massive. All it was proposed was to dewater the, the pond, cut a channel in so that it didn't manage to collect as much water in the event of, it was only considered a moderate flood as well. And um, the, the engineer suggests a one in 50 year flood even sooner. So, and we all know how those end up at the moment. Bruce. I was just going to mention, I have, uh, when Peter Finlay was on the scene here in council, I did visit those ponds in there. They are quite substantial and quite beautiful, really, as, as a pond, if you look at a pond. Um, but OK, there's, there's other issues involved, but um, yeah, it's a quite special place. OK, thank you. Anyway, hey, look, didn't want to hold up um, the plan for the day too much, but um, yeah, just to give you a sense of what's going on. All right, everybody, OK. Thank you for your patience, Mika and Carl. Appreciate that. Um, so look, we will um, head back into our agenda. So if we want to live stream again, so we. Sorry, I just want to check that you're all aware that the presentation can't be shared. So yep. Have it open. Okay, I think we're we're all operational again. So welcome back, everybody. Okay, we'll just um, hand over to you, um, Mika and Carl, shortly. So we're now on um, the local al alcohol policy review. Um, yeah, I'll just hand it back to you. Now we can't see our slides, of course, on on the screen. So we will need to head into our um, back into our laptops. I'm afraid. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, we're just want to continue on basically from where we left off. Uh, last time with the local alcohol policy review. Um, so if we skip to slide number two, just so that we know we're all on the same page. Um, so yeah, firstly, um, after our previous workshop, uh, got quite a lot of feedback saying it's very confusing. <laughs> so you might have noticed that it, the slides have changed a little bit. Uh, hopefully this makes it easier for everyone to understand. Um, but yeah, happy for you to provide feedback on how you like your information. So um, please, yeah, um, let me know if it's not working for you. So on slide number three, there's quite a complicated looking diagram. Um, it's there to show you that it is complicated, <laughs> this process. So please just bear with me. Uh, but the bit that we are focused on is just that little box that says the local alcohol policy with the red circle around it. Um, so just so you know where that sits. And the, the purpose of this really is to, uh, for the local alcohol policy to direct the district licensing committee. So the default is if you know, there's nothing specific in the lap saying this is um, how the council would like this to be done, then um, the the default is that the district licensing committee makes that decision. So, 
yeah, so this is just a, a direction um, for them, but the final decision making power lies with them. Has everyone found it? Everyone know we're on page 15, yep, of our workshop. So the, the next slide, um, it's titled Directly Borders, which includes across the road. So that is just in there to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, what directly borders means. So you can see it is actually uh, just across the road, or sorry, facing the, the premises. So it's not directly beside, it's not behind, it's uh, in front of it, essentially. So just so we're all clear what that actually means. We did get stuck on that a little bit last time. Um, so on licenses, next slide. So, so we're all clear what we're talking about. Um, this includes places like cafes, restaurants, uh, BYO restaurants and caterers. Next slide. It's the one with on licenses and a little map. So this presentation has basically been boiled down to um, the decision points uh, for simplicity's sake. The black letters is where what is currently in the policy and the red is what the three agencies, the police, the medical officer of health and the licensing inspectors are proposing as a possible change. Um, so we have stepped through a couple of these. So I'll just remind you what we sort of um, landed on last time. But for number one, basically it's keeping it the same. So the DLC currently considers if it's relevant or not, uh, where other licenses are in relation to the on-license. For number two, currently only considering schools, early childcare facilities of places of worship as a, a facility to consider. And last time, um, the direction I believe was that we include a couple more uh, as directed by the agencies. So that's a Rehabilitation Treatment Centre, Mirai, Community Facility, Public Park, Health Facilities and Recreational Facilities. So this is just more places to consider. Do you want feedback as we go? Yes. Okay. I'll start the number two then. You're probably not excited by the public park recreational facilities. I think that's a really attractive thing. Cafes love kind of, you know, being close to those. They provide a really good uh, viewing platform. So absolutely agree with um, the, the existing ones and more than happy to consider rehab health facilities. And I'll leave Dalmarie and perhaps Bill to decide whether Mariah is appropriate or not to include in there. Marcus? And look, I'm on the, um, the liquor licensing committee, and the, we're so lucky in Waipa that we've got a lab. It's saved, like it's it's made things really easy for us in the future. This is quite important. But yeah, I don't believe public parks should be in there as well because, you know, if you had Podium Cafe at Lake Catapiro, they wouldn't be able to serve alcohol, um, and, and things like that. So that makes it very restrictive. Circus, the Circus um, Cafe. Oh, yeah, at that would be another one that couldn't yeah. go that direction. So it was wrong. Yeah. Um, Bill, then Roger. Mm. Sort of, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, um, part of me says that Tino Ronga Tiratanga um, should allow us to make a decision about Marais and not have it determined by others. Um, that's my initial thoughts in regards to um, slotting Marais into there. It's, it's ours to decide. Okay, well, well Dame Marie, would you like to uh, counter that with a sound? Looks. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm countering it, but um, Bill, I'd like to see it um, included because I think there's already too many um, licensing um, facility uh, these types of things around Marae as it is now. I'm not talking about within Te Awamutu, but I'm thinking about. Um, possibly out near Kiki and places like that, um, even though we don't have marae that are situated close to these types of things. But I, I, I do agree with what you say around Tanoranga Tiratanga, but I think this is where we apply that here for us. And do we want to have these types of facilities around our marae? Um, because I certainly do not want to have these vaping or anything like that around our marae. I don't think that they bring us any whakamana 
they don't do they don't fuck a money or kopapa. Um, and I think between you and I, if we have a wānanga around that tanoranga tiratanga, this is where it gets applied within an, in a council realm, is what I would believe. But that may be something you and I talk more about. Mm. Could I, I'm sorry, maybe just clarify. Um, so this would be places for the district licensing committee to consider when they get an application for someone to establish a new cafe, for example. Um, and they're like, then they sit there and consider is this cafe appropriate next to this X facility? And so the district, then the decision would lie with the district licensing committee. Um, in the current process that would require the marae to come to that committee meeting and make a submission um, and say that we believe this is not appropriate. Uh, but if it's not included, then would just sort of possibly fall by the wayside and not be considered at all. Okay, so it's a consideration. Okay, um, Mike, did you want to carry on with that theme? Otherwise, I'm going to move to Roger. It's the part of that same bit, yep. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that word minor is quite important um, because a, a cafe next to a, a marae or a school or whatever that serves alcohol is different to a, a pub or a club. So I guess that ultimately comes back to to be considered by the group that you sit on. So, so there is, you know, there's a backstop here. Thanks, Mike. Okay, Roger, and then we'll go to Lou. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm of a similar mind, I think, to yourself in terms of the inclusion of uh, public parks and recreational facilities. And I'm thinking not only of now, but I'm thinking of the growth of our two, of our district and the fact that the district will see the development of new recreational facilities, of new public parks, servicing all these new suburbs that we're creating. I wouldn't like to see another barrier placed in front of developers in terms of providing the community services and resources for those new areas. So I'd just... I'd be resistant to including public parks and recreational facilities. I'm just wondering around health facilities as well. Is that going to capture gyms and things like that? I believe it's aimed more uh, to include places like medical facility, like a medical centre or rehabilitation centres. I can understand the rehab centre treatment facilities, but health facilities I'm probably concerned that we might be capturing things. I think about uh, Anglesey Clinic and there's a great cafe just, you know, a couple of doors down and, and they do a great dinner service. So I guess, you know, the, we're probably going to be unintended consequences if we, if we don't have a really clear understanding of what health facilities mean. So I'm probably reluctant to include that as well, unless there's other. And just to add to that, there'll also be development of a doctor rooms of you know medical rooms in these new subdivisions which will inhibit the development of other services to the community absolutely again another unintended consequence uh, mike yeah and just that rehabilitation i mean i'm assuming we're thinking drug and alcohol but i'd want that if it stays in there to be very specific because going to the that could fall under medical but a physio is rehab so if it is going to stay there, it would need to be fairly prescribed. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree, though. I think the thing is here, I don't think we want to rush this, <laughs> because there is going to be, we brainstorm this, consequences all over the place. Lou. Yeah, just to enter into the conversation, I think we've got to read the thing. It says no new process, license processes, uh, premises bordering, directly bordering, those are two words. The thing is, with a public park, most of those are alcohol-free now. So under the existing legislation, you cannot have a retail outlet with, I think, 100 metres or... Uh, no, you can, Lou. Mighty River Domain's a good example. We, we, we've, got, we've got, like, the rugby club, mm. but you're still limited to where you can actually retail. So it is, there's a, there's a limitation where you can put it. Um, yeah, these are on licence, I realise that. This is, uh, they're on licences. Sorry, yeah. currently... We, we have... Yeah. Good examples of um, on licenses on recreational facilities now. 
Hmm. I know. We're, and we're happy with them. Yep. Are you saying you're unhappy for well, any I'm new ones? Well, I'm just saying ones? that we, we, we are looking at a situation. What I'm saying is that we're looking at new premises, okay, and don't we have enough? As I say, on licences already. So are we allowing more and more on licences? Well, that's at the discretion of the... Of, Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I'd be happy to... I mean, we're going to have new public reserves as we grow. So I wouldn't want to have... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to not have those. Yeah, so we're, we're growing all the time. So, um, Claire. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pleased with the conversation about trying to be very careful that we're not actually closing off opportunities and it's specifically to, um, I suppose, address mm. um, people that might have dependencies on alcohol or whatever and make sure that those things aren't there. Because um, it was the new development that I'm really interested in because I'm a real advocate for mixed development yeah and that would mean you could have cafes next to medical centers you know and next to retail like um yeah and um so, so I, I i'm probably erring on the side of, of not adding too many more um restrictions and and relying on on the district licensing committee to mm. make the call if, if, if there's a gray area so as i understand it we'll, we'll, we'll keep the rehab treatment in there but it needs to be more prescriptive and marae and we will let dale marie and bill have a have a corridor around around whether that's appropriate or not um is everyone happy with that and we'll move on to number three yeah okay no new licenses 40 meters from facilities a non-commercial area so i was a bit confused by that um so if you have a look at the map uh the commercial areas Currently are the orange areas and yellow is residential. So this, I just want to point out that the map provided on this slide is just as an example that 200 meters is just so you can easily go and walk that distance and see what it feels like. Um, also for 200 meters, a, a good example is in Cambridge, uh, Victoria Street in the middle, uh, from roundabout to roundabout, that's just under 200 meters, sorry, just over 200 meters. Um, and on Alexander Street here, um, from roundabout to roundabout, it's about 440 metres. So just so you can get a feel. Um, Roger. Yeah. Thank you. This definition that you're showing in the map, um, I can see that for in the business central district, but we're now again seeing developed in our suburbs, for instance, the the Swain Road Convenience Centre, which has a dairy and a pub, but they're in residential areas. And if this is going to be the only definition of commercial, what's going to happen to these commercial convenience centres that are developed in different subdivisions? Um, I might just park that one for a little bit because I feel like you might be talking about off licenses. Um, no, no, I'm actually talking about on licenses as well. Because they are different, um, different. No, there's an on license in Swain Road. Yeah. And in, um, I think, in Kelly Road, you know, the, the development there where you've got, yeah. Probably it'd be helpful if you referred to the maps um, attached to the as appendix um, in the memo. And I put in a few more um, smaller towns and tried to capture all of the towns so you can see where the current commercial areas are. Um, so just take note that these commercial areas are linked to the district plan. So if the district plan for whatever reason changed, then that would also change. So, Roger, can I just ask you, what were you getting at? Well, do, you, do you agree with the 200 or not? Um, Probably not. I'm concerned that the convenience centres and the future convenience centres in the new subdivisions that are going to be created are actually designated as commercial areas and not non-residential areas that happen to have a commercial outlet in them. So is the Swain Road commercial the, the Swain Road convenience precinct designated as commercial or residential it'll have to be commercial yeah well it would, 
but yeah, it needs to be clearly identified. So we're, we're, a, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. So what we're talking about now is in a non-commercial area. At the moment, it says that can't have any new on licenses 40 metres from facilities. And the suggestion is we go to 200 metres. And that is a um, that is unless the effects are no more than minor. So it's not saying no new yeah, on yeah. licenses. It's saying that can they you have give to us a good evidence. Sorry, Mika, we got that. Yeah. So can you give me an example of what a current on license is in a non-commercial area? Just it'll help with the level of understanding, I think. What's a good example? Because I'm struggling to think of one. A rural cafe. A rural cafe. Good idea. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Red Sherry. Red Sherry. So we would be stopping anyone else from setting up another rural cafe within 200 metres of that. Of that. No, from a facility. Sorry, a facility rather than a premise. Yeah. These are yeah. these are these facilities, not licensed premises. Yeah, from a yeah, yeah from a facility. So we're stopping them setting up a rural cafe 200 metres down the road from a rehab centre. It's a really, really unique set of circumstances, to be honest. Or a sports club. Yes, again, I think we might be unintended consequences. I'd probably be leaning towards leaving it at 40. I don't know. How does everyone else feel? I think like, it's, it's, it's worked really well for us in the mm. past. I don't mm. think we should make, be making it more complicated because at the end of the day, the Liquor Licensing Committee has got the authority to yeah. go. So you're happy with the 40? I, I'm happy with the 40. I, I wouldn't muck around on the ground with it. Okay. Any contrary view to that? Everyone's happy? Okay. Okay, number four. People can, the other thing, that, like, you know, when this, if, if Claire does an application, she wants to start a new cafe at her house, the, the people can still object to it and do submissions and stuff about it anyway. So, so there's still that element that, that you know, the locals, and the same with the Marae, like, we could leave it out and just keep it simple, but if people object it, then we can hear that and make a decision around that at the hearings. And okay. Yeah, the majority of those would have potentially been through a resource consent process first is the other consideration. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You've still got that resource consent process to fall back on as well. Okay. Yeah. All right, number four, no district limit on total number of on licenses. I think we were in agreement we were happy with that. Number five, new licenses limited to areas zoned to allow commercial activities as permitted activities or by the RC. So if you're going to set up again a rural a cafe in a rural area. Or also like a, a restaurant or, or, a, or a cafe in an urban area as well, like converting a house into to a, a restaurant in the residential zone. How does that connect? Oh, yes, yes. Is this well, new? No, that's, that's commercial. Is number five a new, a new thing? Well, this is what we've currently got, right? Yeah. This is what we currently have. So no, no change proposed to what we No change, okay. Have. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Good. Next page. Off on licenses still. <laughs> Trading hours. Yeah, so this this is relatively simple. Um, so trading hours currently for on licenses. Um, currently it is at 2 a.m. So the uh, agencies are proposing to reduce it to either midnight or 1 a.m. after looking at what uh, premises are currently operating at. So they might be licensed till two, but they tend to shut earlier. So they'd like to bring it back. I'm very mindful we're not really represented by youth here. Okay, just saying. I'm pretty sure if anyone under the age of 30 was in this room, they'd be wanting to keep the 2 a.m. But I, I understand all the... Look, this gets reviewed regularly. I mean, as we, as we grow and we have nightclubs and, and bigger potential things, there are opportunities in the future to change this, but are we of a mind to keep it the same or to reduce, Roger and Claire? And I think that you've hit the nail on the head when you talk about what are our centres, the size, the population, and we'll be wanting to develop recreational facilities in the centres as well. Um, to provide a safer environment, now they pop over to, to Hamilton and 
get Ubers back. But uh, yeah, I prefer to see the opportunity to have a, a rec a, an entertainment facility after 12 o'clock, should it be required in the future. Okay, clear. Yeah, so I, I'm in favour of reducing that um, closing time to, to midnight or 1am. It's just that in the supporting documentation, there was quite a lot of evidence produced that it's at that later time of the day, at, at night, yeah, when all the problems um, are, are reported to police and things like that, if you could get people to stop drinking an hour earlier or something, it might not be so bad. So I, I'm just in favour of um, reducing it, e even to 1am. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about the bottom one, which is the outdoor dining area to 10 p.m. I actually thought 11 o'clock wasn't too bad, um, but but you know, I presume that the second one is that if you're within 200 meters of a residential zone, you have to operate with set hours and demonstrate that you're not having a, an adverse effect. So in fact, you're increasing the net um, that, that protection kind of thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd support that as well, yeah. Okay, anything on the side of the room? So what I'm hearing at the moment is that we, um, is that we go to 1 a.m. for the first bullet point and then for the bottom one, keep it the same at 11 p.m. Yeah. Okay, everyone happy with that? Andrew? Yeah, I, I'm not unhappy with that. I, I think probably we'll bring our problems forward an hour, but at least it lets the cops go. <laughs> These are let the cops go to bed at a more decent time, so I'm sure. We might have some more street signs that stay up um, on a Saturday night in Cambridge. <laughs> just want to point out that um, the people under 30 actually drink less alcohol than people over 30. So it's people, um, yeah, yeah, 40 and, and older are the, are the problem people, yeah, and they might not be able to stay up that late. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess my, my comment was just in relation to the hours because I just know how many night owls we have um, in the younger generation and they do tend to sleep in a little bit longer and stay awake a little longer. Hey, um, so with the middle border point, which is the, sorry, the 100 metres from residential zone with set hours, do we want to increase it to 200 metres? The problem with this one is that 200 metres is, not, is a long way. And the residential zone right, wraps right around the commercial zone, so it would capture it in that net, right? Yes. Is that right? I, I would actually like to get some feedback from Carl on this one, since you're the one that has to implement the rules. That's the one thing I haven't mapped out. It's the one thing I haven't mapped out, but yes, 200 metres. You just need to have a good understanding of how much of the CBD 200 metres might encompass. In the, the 100 metre one has worked. I think it's only been implemented in perhaps two cases that I can think of, um, where a premises is within that 100 metre range and coincidentally was also in close proximity to a retirement village and stuff. So those staggered hours were a reasonable approach in that case. We have our zoning rules for a reason. And so if you're extending 200 metres into another zone, it's you're kind of negating a lot of the reason that you're zoning, I think. So I, I thought status quo for me on this one. All right, status quo it is, I think is what I'm, I'm seeing. Okay, one way door restrictions. Change optional one hour before closing, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Police were quite strong on this one. I thought it was a pretty reasonable request. So you're not cutting people's fun off, but you're helping the police. They're asking you're not for moving I it was around. This one. So and once it gets to midnight, you're staying in the same premise. Through. People going from one bar to another, because when one bar closes, they go to another. We've seen that quite a lot, just up the other end of the main street. Roger? Just have a point of clarification here. If in number one, we reduce it to 1 a.m., doesn't that therefore by default mean that one hour before closing on every day becomes 12 o'clock? That's currently um, optional to have a one-way door restriction. So this would make it compulsory to have oh, a one-way right. door okay. restriction. Mike? So, Roger, you alluded to the fact that a lot of people go to Hamilton to go out. So, therefore, they're taking their money out of district. They're still going out. And then you're having to pay probably near on 100 bucks for an Uber or a taxi, definitely a taxi. So, I, I don't support this at all. Um, 
people do bar hop, good on them. Um, place closes at 12 o'clock in town, they'll jump over to the stags or something, they'd open till one. We were all young ones, people. Give these people a life. Just Give the businesses a chance. I just have to point out that it's not closing the bar. It's it's just it's a one way door restriction, so it stays open. Yeah. But you only go out. If you go yes, out. but you go out. Can't you go in. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but I mean, like, you can still stay in and keep drinking. Oh, and I realise that, but you can't go in. So I I understand it. It's like me going to McDonald's, seeing all the burgers I want after a few jars, but I can't get them. Good point. I mean, I, look, I, I would, I would, much. yeah, I would like to. Um, oh, I can't even concentrate now. <laughs> I would have really liked to think Cambridge can attract the nightlife for our for our young and our youth going forward. It is a growing town, and you know, I, I hear regularly there's not much in um, in Cambridge. So there will, as we grow, we will we will have um, you know other. Um, businesses and experiences open up. So I, I feel like we're quite divided on this one at the moment. So I need a little bit more direction, Claire. This be something we consult on because this is all in preparation. Great idea. Let's do that. On. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys read those impact reports that are in the supporting material. Yes. I would hate to have to be um, working in one of those bars where that kind of stuff's going on. And it's all, you know, these measures set in place to try and stop that kind of stuff happening. I, but we I have brought it back in there. Yeah, that, that restriction of um, the, the one way means you're staying in, which is kind of almost counterintuitive to the notion, right? I, 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 I'm not in favour of the, the one way door restrictions as being compulsory. It's up to the to the proprietor to make the call about how they manage their... Okay, and look, let's see what the feedback is from, from those um, who are operating at Mika. Sorry, I just want to just to be fair to the agencies who made these suggestions, I believe they they were um, quite adamant that there is a big problem with that staggered closing times um, and just coming for, for them, they are coming from that um, harm reduction space. And that is something that they see a lot of issues with. Um, so I just wanted to remind you that, that that's where that came from. All right, well, this will be a good one to consult on, I think, um, and we'll hear from people directly. Is everyone happy with that? We're going to move on to on on. To, we're going to move on to off licenses. So, so yeah, just uh, again because we got stuck on this a little bit last time. I uh, provided a list of what an off license is, and something in particular just for you, Roger. Um, uh, the difference between a grocery store and a dairy. Uh, so this is from. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, I'm just going to read you this a little bit because it is confusing. It's not very clear, but this is how you distinguish between a grocery store and a dairy. Um, a grocery store is basically a store that looks and smells like a grocery store and principally sells food products. Whether a store principally sells food products is determined by an analysis of it, its revenues. Revenues have the GST, tobacco, excise ta tax, and Lotto Kino removed and are then split into five categories to qualify as a grocery store and therefore be eligible for an off license. Food products must be the largest category of revenue. So, just so that we're all clear. What just learned something new today? What does a grocery store smell I like? I can accept that, but I can't see where that's relevant to our decision as to whether we allow, you know, whether it be a dairy or a What's the other one? It's uh, background information. Yeah, background yeah. information. It's all good. Because we're going to get those retail units established in our new subdivisions, whatever we call them. Yep. And we'll, someone else decides what ca what categorization they get. So, yeah. all right. So we're on to off licenses. Where should off licenses be located? So proposing no new off licenses within one kilometer or 500 meters of an existing off license. I would like to see less off licenses. I think that's the direction our community is certainly um, talking to me about. So proposing a distance between two is a good start. Monty. Yeah, just on that, if, if I'm always talking Cambridge, if we're going to massively intensify Cambridge, one kilometre is the entire CBD of Cambridge. Correct. So you were saying new, no new 
um, off licenses ever. Just again, unintended consequences. Do we really want to do that? I would rather see a cap than probably a distance. Uh, that's but but then a cap, you know, is a tricky one again because we need we need well it needs to be a continually re reviewed, you know, every few years. But happy to. Needs to be a ratio to population. Exactly. Oh, there we go. Excellent analysis. Lucky we've got you, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to? Do we want to consider what that? Well, I think we're going to come to a cap later, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. So, do we have any one kilometer or five hundred meter existing. existing? Going once, going twice. I'm, I'm, I'm not in favour of it. I, it's just it's it's once again it's, it's too restrictive. But if this is going out for public consultation, then then, then, then surely the public can tell us. Okay. So but, nothing. What about you, Claire? Yeah, so I'm I'm with you, Liz, about wanting to see some kind of controls because that is definitely what I'm hearing as well, and it's in the literature as well that we've got to find some way to limit the numbers. And the best way to do it, I mean, I think um, consulting on it would be really good. I'd like to see whatever's most appropriate. I mean, it can be a distance. I mean, it could be less than a kilometer. Yeah, okay, or. I'm not sure about the per, per capita thing because some of the stuff that was mentioned about was the actual just just the impact of seeing shop after shop after shop all off licenses and they use really bright colours that they're pretty intrusive for people you know things like that so I I would want to avoid that because it 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 sort of um, undermines the the amenity you know mm -hmm. of our CBDs as well yeah so um, yeah all those things are important so yeah I do support consulting on it. So can I just make a point that market forces will determine a lot of the presence of off licenses because your example there of off license after off license after off license after off license in a street ain't gonna happen. You know they wouldn't they wouldn't exist. No, absolutely. Okay. Any other debate on this one? Mike. Yeah, even 500 metres. We Between two roundabouts, we've got 200 metres. 500 metres is still a long, a long way. You put a pin somewhere and do a 500 metre. Um, just for last time, uh, I believe the direction was actually 500 metres, um, is what was settled on. Right. Uh, just remember, these are also distances that they don't have to be these distances. These are. Yeah options that have been provided yeah exactly. yeah so right so 500 meters and consult can i can i just give a an example and again it's cambridge that the good union has an on license plus an off license i would imagine that the masonic when it gets developed will have an on license and an off license so immediately you're beginning to restrict the development of other services outside that proximity to those establishments. And there's certain parts of our towns where it may be appropriate to have more than one within a short period of distance because parking might be more suitable. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to change that. I'm going to suggest 200 metres for consultation or nothing, leave it. Well, the current is nothing. Should just leave it. Okay, let's, let's not propose any any. There's not not pro pro propose any uh, distances. Then is everyone okay with that? Well, I would like to put um, some distance. Maybe that's um, picking up on the recommendation of you know, those agencies. Okay, because um, they they are giving a clear message that off licenses are probably one of the greatest contributors to you know um, alcoholic abuse and you know harm. Okay, and so that's the, that's the one that really needs the better controls. Um, and so I would, I don't just want to have us go out to consult and say, at the moment, for off licenses in commercial areas, you know, there's, um, as long as you're not directly bordering, you know, you can, you can set up. I, I'd like to say the, the suggestion has been, um, you know, from these agencies that we should have, have a limit like 200 meters what do you think of it 
year rather than just leave it. Shall we just keep the status quo? All right, is there support no, for I mean, Claire's? I'm hearing. Yeah, because no. I don't want Not these ahead. outlets to be treated as just like another retail shop. These are a source of social harm, okay? And and the, the whole idea of having a lap is, is to address the harm that alcohol does. Yeah. Okay, Roger? Yeah, I'm concerned about the restriction on commercial opportunity and service to the community. Into the selling of alcohol, whether it's on license or off license, is still a legal activity, and it's a service to our community that's provided by certain establishments. If we start to restrict the length, the, the distance between them, we're beginning to restrict commercial opportunity, and I don't think that that is valid. But I do agree with any restriction on a ratio of off licenses to population, but not to determine where they should actually be. Leave it to the, um, the DLC to make that judgment. Can I just add something in this? I hear you the original proposal. It's currently DLC decides if proximity to other premises is relevant. And rather than set a criteria, I leave it to our licensing commission. They have to consider that when they make the, when the application is made. Okay, Susan. Rather than us make that decision arbitrarily. Take Te Amuti, for example, you've got all the, take all the count, uh, just the local supermarkets, draw a 200 metre line around that. That's virtually the whole of Te Amuti out. It's kind of, with the countdown packs and saves and all the rest, and all of the other licensed projects. We've got very little area left within 200 metres. So I just think you've got to leave it to the licensing commission. I, I have to agree with Claire. Um, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that there's quite a difference between um, the, the um, data around harm from off licenses versus on licenses. Mm. And, and, I, and I have no difficulty with being a bit, sending a message about making, taking a more caring stance around those off licenses. Um, I think it, it, it sends a, an, a reasonably uncaring and unthinking message just let the market decide. I, I, I think you have to be really honest with ourselves about, about that alcohol related harm in our communities. And at least in a non-licensed scenario, you've got it's somewhat controlled. In this instance, there it isn't. Um, and I mean, we've got more than enough bottle stores around. <laughs> if, you, if you can't get in and get yourself a, a bottle of wine or your six pack of whatever, then something's kind of a bit wrong with you. I, I'm quite comfortable with Claire's suggestion around the, the 200 meter um, limitation. I think it sends a message around the caring nature that we have, that we should have for our communities health and well-being in this space. Okay, right, I need a show of hands here. 200 metres or status quo, which is not putting in a distance. So we give staff direction. So the 200 metres, pardon? For, this is just consulted on. Yeah. One, two, three. Remember this is district wide as well. And there's other, other things in there as well that you can specify center of town or not center. So this is just a, a blanket um, for the whole district. All right, so uh, I counted seven. So we'll just, we'll consult on 200 meters and then we'll obviously have, the community will have their say after that. Everyone happy with that? Yeah, does that feel, does that feel fair? Yeah, okay. All right, okay, moving on to the next one, which is the facilities to consider school. I'm happy with that. These are off licenses we're talking about. Yep, excellent. Okay, move next slide, number three, commercial areas. No new licenses directly bordering facilities. Do we look to increase to within 200 metres radius of these facilities? If you're saying still 200 meeting of facilities, then again, any health facilities that are established in a convenience center restrict the offering of a new off license in that area. I agree. Neighborhood support, like neighborhood, um, you know, 
neighborhood centers call them here are, are, are quite popular and they and they actually do i think add a lot of um a lot to our existing towns especially around you know helping with public transport and all sorts of things and everyone uh, you know if you think you know they having a hairdresser a dairy potentially an off license a cafe you know does mean that people don't have to travel too far from home uh, to be able to do their shopping so I, I do support that that suggestion, Roger, but Claire and then Mike, I think it was. So I contend that those neighbourhood centres will be commercially zoned. They're all commercially zoned. So it's a commercial area, okay? So we, I thought we were working on outside commercial areas. So we're working on, this, this bullet point is commercial areas. Oh, sorry. I thought commercial. that's what we voted on. Number three. Yeah. For off licenses. Oh, this is no new ones. No new, new licenses ones. directly bordering facilities within two, yeah, within two hundred meters, two hundred meters radius of facilities. So of these facilities. are facilities. Yes, yeah. so Madam Chair, your first one was other premises, and this one is now facilities. Yeah. yeah. Those facilities are defined. Yep. Okay. So those are those ones like schools, early childhood centres. Yeah. That's Currently, it's thing. just schools, early childhood centres. Yeah, but we're increasing it to the Marae and rehabilitation centres. Yeah, so Roger's point is if you have got a new neighbourhood centre, uh, that we wouldn't essentially allow a new off licence if it was within 200 metres of a school, let's say, or, or, a, doctor's. or a doctor's or whatever. Yeah, whatever our... I think we decided that that um, the health centre would have to have something that was related to alcohol dependency. We were going to tighten up that definition. Yeah. The definitions will be carried over from what you previously said. Excellent. Yeah. So that, yeah, just a reminder of that. So you're right. That those definitions that we talked about earlier, same. So the same rules will apply to this. Mike. Thank you, Sir Chair. Just looking at number three, and, and I guess I differentiate, and you can't really, but between hard liquor and other liquor, like beer and wine in a supermarket. But the supermarkets get captured in that nine o'clock. Now, I'm not sure over here, but the supermarkets over the other side of the district, they close at sort of 10, 10 o'clock. And just the compliance thing around that, the police know it, but also just the, the staffing of it. And also, you sort of go in to shop in a quiet time, it's often after eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and this sort of gets captured in there. So, yeah, if it was just the hard liquor stores, I'd have no issue with this, but because it encapsulates the supermarkets, I think it's a, it's a bit of a pain. It means that people are probably traveling, you know, you sort of forget you're traveling twice to get your food. You want to get a few beers or wine or something, and all of a sudden, oh, it's closed that part of a shop. I've got to come back. Can I just make a yeah. point on distinguishing mm. between the types of liquor like that? Um, the medical officer of health has said that the type of liquor that causes most harm is your boxed wine that you can buy from the supermarket. Now, I'm just going to clarify, everyone. we're on page 22, off licenses number three. <laughs> It's all right. Sorry. We know you're you're Sorry. one ahead, Mike. It's all good. We'll come to we'll come back to that one in a minute, eh? So just the going back to commercial areas, no new licenses directly bordering facilities. Do we want to increase to within 200 meters? No. Okay. Leave it as is. Okay. Number four, outside commercial areas. No new licenses 40 meters from facilities. That's the existing. And do we want to increase it to 200 or what, meters or something else? Just take. No, we don't. Is everyone in agreement that we increase to within 200 meters? Again, you've got the situation of the bottle stores in dairies in convenience retail areas, which are commercial areas, but they're still very, very close to non-commercial areas. Yep. We're okay. talking about commercial areas yeah. in this one. Though. So if it's a commercial area, you find this is outside of commercial yeah. areas. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And just take note, this is also, um, there's two different things proposed here. There is commercial areas and there's alcohol ban areas. So outside both of these, um, you can see on the map there, the alcohol ban area is indicated by the dashed red line. 
and then the commercial areas that orange zone. So they are they don't quite line up. Um, and again, the yeah you would be linking the alcohol bylaw with the local alcohol policy. Uh, but it is a yeah. So the medical officer of, of health are proposing um, commercial areas be used in this instance, and the um, inspectors are proposing alcohol ban area. So it's just slightly different areas that you're capturing and then with that distance on top of it. So it's sort of like two decisions here. So if you prefer commercial areas or alcohol ban areas being proposed. Could I just clarify Clear. on that? So does that mean that um, the, if there's an alcohol ban area, no new licenses within the alcohol ban area? Because this just... Outside, because it yeah, because it says within five hundred meter radius of facilities, so you'd have to decide where are the facilities. I don't know, I don't quite understand how it relates to the alcohol ban area. Like, what's the decision? It, it's just a an area that's easily definable. Yeah, and so they've just taken different approaches. Um, what that area should look like. And but so for for new for new off licenses. Yeah, would you consider whether or not they were in within 500 meter radius of the the boundary of a an alcohol ban area or or not? Uh, maybe I'm just. Um. So confused. it's just the alcohol ban area or the commercial area mm. for this particular question that we're dealing with four and five mm. okay. is the area that's not being included. So we're. Yeah. blocking out that area and then anything outside of that um, is what we're considering. So where the facilities are outside of that and then where the premises are or the licenses are in relation to that facility. I've still got a challenge with that because it's restricting commercial development around in the, the majority of our you know, 500, 500 meters from that alcohol boundary is a big circle around Cambridge. That's, a, that's too and, big a circle. I don't think we can limit the development of our community and the services provided to that community by doing that. Agreed. So, and we might be able to accommodate that, Roger, if we forget about the alcohol ban area. That's, that's almost too confusing here. And just talk about commercial or non-commercial because it goes to your you know commercial hub in a development that's a commercial area um so i i think when i look at this just forget the ban the alcohol ban area it's too bloody confusing just think about commercial or non-commercial and outside of commercial areas let's just think about whether we want to expand the setback from facilities I would tend to agree with uh, Michael. Do you? I mean, it's. Oh, um, oh yeah, like okay. I think you've, you've actually helped me understand it a bit better. I think because the alcohol ban areas are only in our CBDs, so those new developments that are on the fringes, they wouldn't be in an alcohol ban area. So it kind of would make it easier to set up those ones in those little um, neighbourhood centres. Yeah because they are, I'm pretty sure they zoned commercial, yeah. And so it probably would give you more flexibility to have, yeah, alcohol um, off licenses in those new developments. Just a quick correction yeah. there. But, I mean, I actually, oh, yeah, I was just gonna say though, I do find it confusing about the alcohol ban area and actually they're very, they are very extensive. They're much more extensive than just the commercial area. So yeah, that, that would create other problems. So, Claire, where do you stand on four and five? Mm. point of Yes. And I don't know who could answer this, but I really would like to know, there are certain examples that I've got in here. One is the Taylor Street Dairy and the Urban Kitchen that is right next door, and they are only two outlets is that defined as a commercial area or is that defined as a residential area but the operation has been allowed 
in that residential area through a resource consent. So it's not, it's not a commercial, that's what I'm getting at, that we're beginning to restrict the development of these community services in areas because they are not commercial areas. They are residential areas that have been granted licenses by resource consent. It's a resource consent process. It, it's, um, it has that lens put over it as to whether it's appropriate. I think it's a dairy that's in there. Dairies aren't off licenses. Is that, yeah, dairies aren't off licenses. No, but the restaurant next door is, yeah, yeah, is an on-license. Is an on-license, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's complicated. Sorry, I, I would have to look through the district plan to answer that um, exact question. I'm just wondering if um, inspectors might be able to answer that. But maybe maybe it is easier just to. Um... Taylor Street. Um, sorry, Roger, 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 I think you're talking about Robinson, Robinson Street. Oh, Robinson, Robinson, Robinson Street. Yeah. Sorry, Robinson yeah. Street. Yeah. Comes down off here. Yeah. Comes down yeah. Robinson Street. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry, Mary Fernandez. I'm a licensing inspector. Uh, sorry, what was the question? It's Robinson Street Dairy and the Urban Kitchen, which is next door. Suburban. Is that a commercial designated zone area or is it a license that has been granted through a resource consent? So it's a residential area, but granted a license through a resource consent. So I'm not a planner. Um, I'm not sure what the zone is, but I suspect it's being granted because it has resource consent. So there may be conditions on that resource consent about the hours of operation. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, so maybe it is easier if we just, um, it sounds like alcohol ban area is just confusing everyone. So we'll ignore that. So we'll go back to commercial areas. So outside of the commercial areas, would you prefer increase the radius to 200 meters or 500 meters for facilities? So if there is, in this instance, a park or a recreational facility, um, Sorry, or within 200 ask, meters of it, do we? Can I on? ask the same question? Because yeah, I, oh, sorry, sorry, Roger. So, so when we're talking about facilities, this is back to that list that we were we've talking about. We've taken out parks, we've taken out. We're, we're, yeah, sorry, I couldn't think of the. Uh, the only thing that's left school. in there is a, is a, um, is a rehab or a Marae. Potentially, and then from our eyes out, we're going to wait. Yeah, let's just let's even, just say those two Even for things. off licenses, yes, we said we were going to transfer those things yes. over. I just wanted to make mm. sure um, I will misunderstood you. I thought you meant what was on there, because currently a park is being considered when you consider a DLC when the DLC considers um, off licenses. So for on licenses, just exclude public parks and recreational facilities. For off licenses, include them in the facilities. Yeah, but but I came back to Roger's point, which is if we're in a neighbourhood centre and we've got a, a medical centre and we want to have a fine wine shop, we can't do it. We are, we've got this unintended, so, so that's where I'm coming from. So oh, that's why I thought with that list, we were just going to continue on with the, with the list, but uh, maybe I've got yeah, our wires crossed there. Yeah. Continue with the list. So we have, the list is just those two things. And the, the DLC will consider parks 
all of those things will still be in their list of considerations at the time. And it all comes down to what's appropriate for the space, you know, at the end of the day. And what that space is used for. Because all our public spaces are all used in very different ways. Yeah, I think the Thorn Thornton Road example is a very good one, particularly if that, as you say, was um, issued through a resource consent. If you look at the range of activities that actually occur in Thornton Road, you've, you've got uh, playground facilities, you've got sports facilities, you've got recreational facilities, you've got residential area. So we, I think allowing them to go through on resource consent is fine, but restricting them through the controls that we're starting to talk about, I don't think is acceptable. Okay. Is everyone in agreement with Roger's analysis of that? Thornton Road is a very good example because a lot of us were involved with that and I thought that was a good example, a good outcome. Okay. Is everyone comfortable if we move to the next page? This is where Mike was at before. <laughs> um, folks, so I am going to break for lunch at 12. I believe lunch will be there at 12. And the, uh, yeah, and we'll break for half an hour. So I just want to do if we can do another page or two before then. We are going to finish this today, okay? We're not going to reschedule, we're going to carry on because I think this is really important. Right, so off licenses, number one, where should off licenses be located and the trading hours? So this is where we're talking about the cap earlier. New license premises limited to areas zoned to allow commercial activities as permitted activities or by RC. I'd like so, to see that cap being population ratio rather than a set number. But that would be very hard to implement because it would be constantly changing. Yeah. Growth happens, then the number would change. This policy gets reviewed every six years. Would six years be enough for the same <laughs> ratio? Yeah. Plus the resourcing of it as well. Like, like, have we got the resource to actually do these extra steps and monitor them and stuff? Also, this is just for new license premises, okay? So we're not saying you've got to have a look at the number you've got there and some of you guys have got to close, okay? So what's there at the moment? It's not going to change. It's just new premises. You know, how many do we think would be suitable, you know, in our existing CBDs or whatever, commercial areas? Yeah. Um, I obviously support having some kind of cap. Um, but I'm not prepared to say what that cap would be. Yeah, but I do think we shouldn't just have it unlimited. I think we're all feeling that way. I think it's the, the formula is going to be the challenging piece with this. So we can come back to that later. Yes. Okay, all right. So you've got enough from us. Investigator cap. Investigator cap, brilliant. Number two, no limits on total number of off license. Again, I think we're looking at a limit. And the trading hours, how does everyone feel about that? Oh, okay. yes, yeah. I have a bit of an issue with this, just, you know, because if you run function centres and things like that, you sometimes need to resupply or you need to. So I, I kind of, yeah, the 10 p.m., there are a number of places that close at 9 p.m. anyway. There's one that closes at 10. And, uh, yeah. And that's, I'm just referring to Cambridge, so, but happy to um, hear. Um, Liz, I was interested in the community survey because that came through in the recommendations, yeah, from um, the licensing inspector, I think, in the Ministry of Health. They said it'd be really good to, to conduct a survey so you get a good idea of what the community wants. So like you, you're speaking from your experience, you know, running functions, but a lot of this is really a community level impact, yeah, what's happening, yeah, in the local neighbourhood. So I, I'd be keen to see a community survey on the preferences. Absolutely. And, and maybe that could be different for the different communities. To just clarify, Madam Chair, this is all floss and sours. This is all floss and sours. Yes. Yeah. 
off license hours. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Which you know, just the discussion around function centers, I'm not sure was. No, no, no. It's when function centers need to resupply or you know run out of beer <laughs> and need to go to an off license potentially. So that's that's just these other implications again, Mike. Yeah, I think this one has a big implication, really. So we're going to consult. I just want that wording really clear. That currently it's ten pm, um, or whether you know when when you consult, it's not pushing for nine pm. It's sort of making open that it's ten pm. How do you feel? We'll come you know, back or, with the exact yeah. later. This is just a high yeah. level indication. Yeah, I'm personally I'm current comfortable with getting rid of the red and just staying at ten. Mm -hmm. Three off the back of those particular supermarkets, which gets, which I just think when you go to a supermarket, a lot of people that's where they buy their basic alcohol from. Absolutely, and, and and if supermarkets are having to tape off an area because they do close at ten pm, that is a quite a big ask. You know, it's a that's that's quite a big. Uh, I imagine a logistical nightmare for them. So I. Sorry, another option is just not selling it at the checkout. So you just can't take it out of the store rather than fencing it off. So you have to walk all the way back and put it back? Yes. <laughs> no. No, no. It's not the thing we're talking about, inconvenience to customers. I mean, yeah, that's... look, I hear what you're saying, Mika, but I think yeah. the practicality of it's, yeah. And look, I think um, we've seen other, super, I think we've seen supermarkets push back and other... <laughs> parts of New Zealand around this um, particular thing. So, but I, I... And, you know, I'm asking, as, I'm asking for a vote our, on this thing. Sorry, as our towns grow, at some stage, possibly one of our supermarkets will be open 24 hours as our centers grow. So you've got to look at that in the future. So what are you saying? Well, uh, <laughs> remember this gets reviewed every six years. So. We've, as an example, we've got How Tapu, which we've just freed up for industrial development. There's going to be industrial units out there. There are going to be people working shifts, finishing at all different hours, starting at all different hours, etc. And you're beginning to talk about limiting the service to the community, and I can't, I can't accept that for the future of our two centres. Okay, all right. Okay, everybody. I think we're now finished with the off licence. If everyone's happy, I think we're just going to um, consult on the on the, the 10 p.m., but be open to other other hours. And let's see, let's see what the feedback is. We're going to come back after lunch and do club licences. We're going to take a break and carry on. Club licenses, special licenses, so only three pages to go, but there's another half an hour on that. And there's another workshop.
local alcohol policy review workshop. Are we live, Zoe? Yep, we're live, excellent. Okay, so we're going to resume, we're on page 24, sports clubs, social clubs, club licenses. So we'll move to page 25, where we'll consider where, where should club licenses be located? All right, I'll hand over to you, um, Mika. Chair, and through you, uh, declare an interest. And in this, as far as club licenses, both in GM Sports and the RSA. Yeah, we'll do in conflicts um, outside. Well, when, when we've got a decision making. Forum. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, but I just wanted to declare the fact that I am involved in both. Yep. There's a number of us in the room of interests, and in, um, and this, I would be the same. So would Roger. But uh, yeah, and we're all drinkers. <laughs> okay. All right, Mika. I'll hand back to you. So club licenses, currently uh, they should be located at or near sports grounds or other facilities used by the club if relevant. So obviously this will be relevant for a sports club um, if they have a sports field that they're next to, um, maybe not so relevant for the RSA. They probably don't need to be next to something. So I'm proposing that to say the same. Happy with that? Absolutely. Yep. So I think um, if we. That's the current situation. Current situation. Yes. Number two, the DLC currently decides if it's relevant for a new premises that's being proposed. Um, so they decide if it's relevant if the new premises is next to or close to another premises. So it's up to them to decide if that. Um, Distances. Okay, so what that's saying is that the committee will have, will consider existing, or well, no, new premises. New versus new proposed club licenses yep. next to other licensed premises. Yep. Okay. So is it okay that that club license is 100 meters away from that off license? And that's currently up to the DLC to decide. Okay, clear. I'd like to know from Carl whether or not there have been any issues with club licences, because I would actually have thought they would have been quite um, uh, well well controlled um, places to consume alcohol and things like that. Um, have you had any issues? Not through the chair. The number of licences, the club licences are relatively static. I can't remember the last time a new club premises was licensed on my head so that probably hasn't really been a provision that's been used sort of really much in the past and I thought they're, they're fairly static. Roger. Yeah if I could just raise an example and, and ask you how it fits in. Currently the Rotary Club have a club license and they meet in the school don't you have a special license, Roger? Will that not come under no. club license? A no. separate consideration? Later right. on, we have two, you're two slides ahead. Okay, right, fine. I'll ask the question then. Remind yep. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're on club licenses, which is the sports yes. grounds and things like that. So do we want to move? When we, we talked before about the different facilities, so we do want to carry over our definition, definition our, take out our parks, Parks and recreational facilities? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep Marae and rehab treatment centres. Those are the two we want to include. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's particularly relevant for club licences because, mm. you know, with a club, their main um, purpose of being there isn't related to alcohol and they'd only be serving alcohol at certain times. I mean, I actually wouldn't have a problem with them being next to any of these sensitive, what, what we call sensitive um, facilities. Um, you know, like at the moment, the DLC can have regard to the proximity of, you know, other, other um, activities. I don't really think we need we need to have a radius. I mean, that, that's... Okay, um, that's a fair call. The, that's a fair call, yep. Yeah, because mm. the, the TA club and the RSA, I mean, there's a childcare centre, there's St. Pat's School, like it's all, I mean, they're all quite in this facility. I don't know, they're not new establishments, but you don't, 
you know, you don't have any drunken behaviour outside the TA club. Been no issues, has there, that I'm aware of. And if there's not, then um, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so we're not going to include any of those things. Um, and the second bullet point, which is the proposed no new licences within 200 metres radius of facilities. These are club licences, so mostly operating on near sports fields, I guess. Hmm. How does everyone feel about that? Come on, guys. <laughs> Leave it. The majority do. Then you've got the likes of your Cosmopolitan Club, the Wickman's Club, the RSA and the Tiamatu Club, for example, that are more in the corporate club space, but they're still captured by this. So we don't want... Leave it as is. Okay, let's not include that. Excellent. Number four, no limit. No limits on total number of club licenses. I'm comfortable with that. Agreement? Excellent, next slide. Okay, trading hours for club licenses. I'm in favor of having the same restrictions as other premises or other facilities, you know, so, so change it to midnight, um, the closing time to midnight. I think it would be if going yeah off your previous recommendation it would be one. So oh, sorry, one o'clock. Yeah. yeah, we're going from sorry. two a.m. to one a.m. So this is uh, should we just keep it to one a.m. Yeah, 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 that'd be all right. Yeah, I just not, I'm happy with them to be the same there. Yeah. Okay, and how do we feel about one-way door restrictions? I just want to clarify what a class one club is because this is proposed only for um, class one clubs, and that is a club that has more than a thousand members. And I believe. There's maybe only one of those in Waipa. How is that going to work at your rugby club, Mike? <laughs> nice to ask around that. So <clears throat> is that a thousand? Because with all schools in Cambridge going to clubs, is I it? I think it has to be like a, adults, a adult registered, incorporated society. There's like a proper definition for this. Um, but like Hotapu. Rugby club, whatever it's the full name is. Yeah. Yeah. But they, I don't know if they've got a thousand members, probably not. Okay. So, oh, sorry, Roger. Yes. I've got a question. <laughs> Might seem a silly question. What's the difference between a club that's got 900 members and a club that's got a thousand members? That's the definition in the Act. I know. So but, I mean, what's the difference I'll in putting that. a control? on a club that's got a thousand members and controls on a club that's got nine of them. Doesn't, to me, that doesn't make sense. So just- The class one club is also, um, in the opinion of the territorial authority, operates any part of the premises in the nature of a tavern at any time. I still can't but see- both, both those. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm not hearing that there's a lot of support for a one-way door restriction for club licenses. I support it, but that's because um, the whole idea of having the one-way door restriction is um, to stagger the release of drunken patrons out into the open streets. I mean, that's what it said uh, in the supporting material, which I'm sure you've all read. Um, so that's, and, but we've already dis discussed one-way door restrictions and we've decided that we should consult on it. And I would just like it to include these larger class one clubs as well. That's all. Okay, I'm probably going to challenge slightly there because there should be no drunken patrons if, you know, if, if the host responsibility policies are working. Well, and I would have thought in most of our worlds, you know, that that is a, a, obviously a, something that is police enforced as well. So, I guess if we're looking at a one-way door restriction for our clubs, what would be the benefit of introducing it? Apart from, you know, the obvious intoxication. So but... Agreed. Mike. 
Yeah, just to support that, I mean, all these clubs have all got signs up because a bar manager put the, puts their licence and, and often their livelihood at risk. So, yeah, I mean, it's not like it used to be where it just was tolerated in a sort of blind eye. I, I really, I mean, I have seen these bar managers because it's their job and they're responsible to, in this case, a committee. Um, they're actually very, very good. So I, I, I don't see a reason for it. And there are large fines as well for finding intoxicated persons on your premise. So that's another incentive. All right, so am I, where are we at with this? Are we happy to, we want it included or not included? Not included? Okay, that's the steer at this point, but hey, there's other opportunities. Okay, we should move on to special licenses. I'll let you introduce this part, thanks. Yes, so special license is a little bit unique. It's only for a short period of time um, for an event. So it's, um, yeah, lasts as long as the event lasts, essentially. So not, there are basically no changes proposed um, to most of this. So leaving it up to the DLC um, to decide if it's appropriate to have a special license or if uh, on off or club license would be more appropriate. So remain, that's proposed to remain the same. Uh, trading hours, again, proposed to stay the same, um, none past one and a special license, um, if it's for an area that, for a place that already has a license, you should, uh, on offer a club license, uh, sticking to those hours, there are exceptions to that. And one way door restrictions, uh, the DLC can impose those if it sees appropriate. But any comments on those? Can I just, can I just go back to the um, first page where it talks about the sorts of things? So you've got field days on there. I think you're probably referring to, are you talking to really referring to field days, like Mystery Creek field days? Okay, so that's, that's something else. So field days at Mystery Creek is 1D. So I thought when I looked at that, you're talking about people can go out to the paddock and just have a creator, their own mini field day and get, an, and get a special license. Yeah. So that's not, well, I suppose they could Sorry, try. That was just an example of a festival where you would have okay. a special license. Sorry, don't read into it too much. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to get my head around it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Roger, did you have a question? Yeah, just a point of clarification, I'll go back to the Rotary Club license. They meet once a week for two hours. My understanding is they have a special license, but they don't fit into any of those categories. It's just examples, just so we, just examples. Okay, um, th those categories on that slide is just so we're all sort of in the right headspace. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's, there's nothing going to, from adopting this, there's nothing going to impact that. Uh, we can't say that, but um, that that particular slide with all the different events on it, that's just examples. But we, you might decide something else later on that could impact no. that. No, that's just as well, because yeah. if the Rotary Club didn't have a license, it would probably disappear. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I look, I guess the thing is with specials, it's a bit of a hard one because... If, yeah, and your example was a particularly hard one because you're doing it at a school. It's all about where the where it's located, right? Um, but it's the regularity of it too, which makes it probably an awkward one for you as well. But I think we'll just leave that, park that one. We're not here to discuss that in particular, but, well, Marcus. Well, say, like, it is annoying to do those applications because it's, obviously you've got a set amount of meetings and stuff and, and the guests like theater and it's like, well, but I guess it works out to be cheaper to, rather than getting the on license. So, doesn't it, Carl? And the other thing to consider is it does impose some control um, as opposed to not having a special in place. Um, the length of a special is usually constrained to 12 months. So, you don't have activities that are rolling on indefinitely. That, that's only covering a, a 12, 12 month period. And it, it has to, we have to be satisfied that it's an event. So, and, and for some clubs, what constitutes an event is quite different to others. So it wouldn't necessarily cover a club that was operating all of the time for its usual club activities, but it might for a small club that's meeting for a short period of time and frequently. There's all sorts of different combinations there. 
Okay. Is everyone happy with one, number one? Number two? Number three? It's, there's, a lot, there's lots of may, you know, they, the DLC may impose. So that's really at their discretion. Liz, um, I think some of these Clearly. are good ideas for, yeah, I suppose, minimising harm and that, and making sure big events, um, yeah, are going to be managed in a way that you know there's 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 not, you know, like for instance, no glass, so there's not yeah, broken glass injuries mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think that um, they're all good to have. I mean, it's not like we have to have that in our our lap, do we, for the district licensing? Um, committee to actually be considering those. those sorry, options. are we are we on the discretionary oh, conditions slide? We're on special licenses, aren't we? Yeah. Areas are, considered. Yeah. are those areas considered seeing in black status quo, or are they thought status? Sorry, can you repeat the question? One, two, and three under special licenses yeah. are in black. Are they status quo in our current lap? Yes. Yeah. The yeah, both, sorry, uh, no both trading hours, one-way door restrictions, um, yeah, are current all currently. Yeah, so I thought we'd already dealt with that, and I thought you were on the next page about... Okay, move restrictions. to the next page. <laughs> um, so in answer to your question on the, well, discretionary conditions, um, so you're currently, the DLC um, decides what to impose conditions on, and that agencies are just directing that a bit more. Um, so, yeah. Yes, Lou. Yeah. yeah, just quickly, with the RSA, we do deal with a lot of funerals. Okay, and option number three, and the number two with the no glass options, okay, is absolutely impractical with us because we actually serve all in glass. Okay, and the second point is the restrictions on the number of um, type of uh, transactions, sold transaction. Quite often, the family actually purchases the everybody a couple of drinks. So you're talking of quite a volume sometimes. Could be a hundred drinks, but one family member actually is purchasing all of those to you know for the funeral. So yeah, I. I just wonder whether that restriction needs to be actually in there in those sort of scenarios. This is a discretionary condition. So. And, and the types of vessels is more for taste testings, like at field days. So if you're coming to taste test stuff, we'll specify that you have it in plastic cups, not glasses. I, I wouldn't specify like in a funeral special that the alcohol can only be served in plastic cups. I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay, anything else on uh, page 29, discretionary conditions? Happy with that? Good. Moving on to next steps. Oh, sorry, so you're happy with what? Can I just have a point of clarification? They yeah, are we'll discretionary see. from the uh, licensing committee when the license is granted. Yeah, so, so, yeah so I've got the discretion to say, yeah, that's fine. no, Roger, you can't have it. No, I just wondered where the discretion, where the discretion sits with you. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, but those seven um, proposed options just look like um, all the normal things that you would normally see, I guess, if you were looking at a um, at a special license. So, yeah, feels so it's like that's just, a it's just making it that you have to consider them, than rather may consider them. Yeah, no, no, I think that's sensible. Okay, cool. Um, that's pretty much it. So, I just wanted to clarify on the on the discretionary conditions. There are some proposed for the other licenses as well. There was just too much to cover today. Um, and I think they will make more sense. They are in the, the reports provided by the agency. So I do recommend you, you read them, uh, but it'll be easier when we come back perhaps with a, a draft or something to look at them then rather than today. Um, but there are more, just so you know. Um, so for uh, the next slide, the next steps, um, so, same as what we sort of talked about before, uh, we're still investigating, collaborating with um, Otrahonga District Council and possibly combining this review with the alcohol um, control bylaw, which is due for review in 2025, but we think it makes sense to do them together because you're talking about the, the same thing. So it's the two things that, um, yeah, we're just trying to get underway. So we'll come back with more information on that later. And then the final slide, uh, where to from here? So 
Um, hopefully, uh, yeah, in a little bit, it just depends what the bylaw is doing. Um, we will come to you with a decision report. Uh, and yeah, just so remember, we covered a lot today, but basically the next step is deciding um, if the lap should be kept um, or if it, if it should be kept, if it should stay the same or if it should change. So that's basically just so you understand what's sitting behind it um, and what it is doing. And final thing is there was a recent uh, legislation change. Um, you might be aware of the sale and supply of alcohol um, community participation bill I received royal assent. And so it does change the final part of this, and this actually happened between the two uh, workshops. Um, there is no more appeals process. So once a council adopts the, the final um, policy, that, that's it um, basically for the process. And that, yeah, that's a bit different to what it used to be. Any questions on that? No. Oh, good. Cool. Thanks, Mika. Well done. Yeah, thank you. For your I know patience. this is a, this is a hard one. This is, this yeah. is on par with the gambling, isn't it, Monty? So <laughs> it's a hard uh, lots of hard conversations, but it's been some really excellent debate. So thanks, Carl, for your support as well. Appreciate that. All right, everybody. We have our, our one last open workshop, and David has been waiting so patiently. Had to. Learned lots about alcohol now, I'm sure. <laughs> alcohol policies. Um, okay, so we are going to look at the key aspects of the Natural and Built Environment Act and Spatial Planning Act for an update. Thanks, David. Over to you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, good afternoon, all, Madam Chair. Um, you've had a long day already. I, I understand the audio visual is not working. Um, could you please, have you all got a copy of the slides in front of you? <clears throat> With your permission, I'd like to whiz through this and, and then happy to have any questions. So start off with the big announcement really is we now have a replacement for the RMA that um, with the enactment um, 24th of August, 20, well, 23rd of August re received Royal Assent for the new resource management legislation, which comprises the Natural Built Environment Act and the Spatial Planning Act. Um, you might remember there's a third piece of legislation that forms part of that resource management reform, and that's the Climate Adaptation Bill or Act in the future. And that we don't have a date yet, but it looks like it, that highly likely next year, 2024, before we see that. Um, so today, I'm just going to take you through. So what does it mean for WIPA? What are the big changes? Um, if you turn to, um, it's probably slide six gives you the new system on a page. So that was a, um, Simpson Grierson diagram that was put together to try and explain what looks like a very complex piece of interaction between the two pieces of legislation. So we're um, on page 194, undiligent. Oh, bigger your pardon. Yep, I'm good. <clears throat> so you, you've got two pieces of legislation that really could be one. In, in actual fact, and if you look at it carefully, the Spatial Planning Act is secondary really to the Natural Built Environment Act. Um, you can have the Natural Built Environment Act um, without the Spatial Planning Act, but you can't have the Spatial Planning Act without the Natural Built Environment Act. So the Natural Built Environment Act is really the mother legislation in my mind, um, and, and the Spatial Planning Act is a secondary piece to that. Now, the really important part uh, about the new legislation is there was a lot of criticism about what was wrong with the RMA that uh, culminated in the 2019 Randerson Commission. And the, the failures of the RMA were, one, it's effects based. So it's got nothing about desired outcomes or what we want to have as a natural environment state in New Zealand. 
it was simply treating every single development application on merit um, against effects as, as anticipated. What has been put in its place is something that is way more about desired outcomes. So the difference is the RMA was a kind of bottom-up approach. It left everything for councils to kind of grapple with and work through. Um, the new legislation is much more top heavy. So it's much more government setting direction through the national planning framework. And then um, a second tier down from that, a new entity regional planning committees to be established. Um, the interesting thing with this is it doesn't relate directly to an equivalent in local government terms. So it's not saying the regional council will have the responsibility for that. It's an entirely new body. Um, it also is autonomous at this stage. So there is a, an issue where all the local authorities provide membership to the regional planning committees but the regional planning committee is not answerable to any electorate directly, only indirectly back through down through the councils. Um, and the regional planning committees will be the bodies that will have to put together the new rule books, the development rule books. So our district council's um, district plan, which is our current rule book, will in time be superseded by a new natural built environment um, plan that will be put together by the, the new regional planning committee. So what we will see is all the local authorities will lose power in a sense to this new entity. And they will have limited say through their representatives on that body. Um, and, and they will be responsible for merely implementing that plan. So. Where does that leave WIPA? It will in the future become a consenting body. So it'll be managing planning consents, resource management consents, but it won't have its own plan under the new legislation that will be done at a regional level. Um, looking ahead, um, the, one of the important things to realize is this isn't going to happen tomorrow. Um, it's going to be a, a long, slow process of bringing in the new legislation. The, the first change, um, big change, will be the first national planning framework. And it, it has been accepted that it will be a cobbling together of the existing national policy statements that have been issued by government. So the first iteration um, is being worked on and will be notified next year and it should be in place by 2025 so two years before the first big change happens but for the councils um, for most councils through the country we will remain operating under the rma um, for probably at least 10 years so quite a long road ahead before we see a changeover to the new legislation. Um, the, the next big change will be after the national planning framework will be um, the government will decide on a first tranche of regions across the country that will be required to um, put in place a regional planning committee. Um, and that those regions that are required to do so will have a period of time to do that. And they are to serve as guinea pigs for the rest of the country in terms of we learn from what they get right and what they get wrong. Um, uh, yeah, so first step, national planning framework, second step, the regional planning committees, and then only do they start work on a natural built environment plan for their region. And, and the first ones are reckoned to be only really probably in 10 years time. So it's, it's going to be a long process. And only when that natural built um, plan is, is notified, will there be a, a transition made at a local council level to the new system. So we will, 
um, although they, they're pains to point out, government is at pains to point out, you will only operate under one piece of legislation at a time, and we will remain under the RMA for a significant period of time. There, it is not entirely true in my mind, because once the regional planning committees come into being, they will have to prepare a regional um, special strategy for the region, and that will be probably primarily tasked with things like bulk infrastructure at this stage. Um, so we will be working over time under two systems, and, and there will be costs with that. There will be resourcing requirements for that and a huge amount of uncertainty. So this little run through that I've given you today is simply from a planning point of view. The other perspective not in here is a legal one. And we've had uh, a webinar or two from, from um, resource management lawyers, and they see lots of work for themselves ahead because there's a lot of new terminology in the new legislation and it's not tested. So it's not been tested through a court process. So they do see a, a, a lot of work ahead. Now I'm open for questions. Yes, thanks for that. Uh, I'm not going to be around. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the point. Um, do you recall when we attended the uh, uh, conference last year, there was a considerable session which held a lot of interest about the fact that if they were to push through this legislation in urgency, we would finish up with plan legislation. And you hint that the legal fraternity have already seen that that may well be the case. Are we not jumping from the flying pad into the fire? If this uh, is a result of it being pushed through this quickly. One of the things I didn't um, tell you that's in the slide is um, the other uncertainty is the general election on the 14th of October. And we have two parties that have said they will not go with the new legislation. Um, it begs the question, what would you do? Um, because both have said the RMA has failed us. So it, 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 there's no easy answer, uh, Councillor, in, in my mind. I think there are many um, desirable attributes in the new legislation in terms of being outcomes focused, um, I think uh, there was initially with the draft legislation, it, it looked like it had two key goals. One was protecting the environment, the other was enabling development, which looked like they were running at cross purposes. And they've now come up with one purpose, which is protect the environment first, then enable development. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It, we, we might well be in the frying pan. Interesting to see what happens on, on the conference on Thursday and Friday and what kind of discussion mm. there is, because I'd imagine that there will be a similar discussion. Then, well, we know the risk with the senior program already. Yeah. 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 Um, Bill and then Lou. Kia ora. My question, uh, just like so many of um, it's, it's about the retrospective application of the legislation. And one of the things that we've been struggling with on a general is the code for the council to go under the river. So, in my reading of the Curtis Act, that, that would be, that would not be possible. And so, um, I'm just curious as to our retrospective and how it might Mm. I, I, 
to be honest, I don't have a good answer for you there, Bill. Um, I would say one of the things to bear in mind is we have Tetura Faimana um, currently. So that has very, very high status um, legally. And so there's good grounds for contesting it on, on, the, on those grounds, I would think. Thank you. Thank you through, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your report. Um, I'm just noticing that we actually have a national planning framework which takes precedence over everything. So really, we're totally top down. So everything to, is dealt from Wellington. So ultimately, we lose control of virtually all of our local planning or strategic planning altogether. So that is actually going to be run actually from all from Wellington, which unfortunately for New Zealand on a three year election cycle, a triennium will change and could change backwards and forwards over a triennium. Yeah, you know, as a new government is elected. So that leaves me one big concern. The third, second concern is the climate adaption. Okay, we have a piece of legislation sitting in the wings we don't know anything about. Now, that is that going to be introduced so that its conditions can be implemented retrospectively to anything that we have actually made resource consents over that period of time? Mm. Because as a resource commissioner, I just look at this and think, this is, this is a, a national disaster. We're heading where we have no clear knowledge of what we can adjudicate on. We're left with a situation where any decision we make at this level and at a local level will actually transit to actually back to a government minister who, with a stroke of a pen, can deny or accept anything. Is that, is that a correct analogy? Um, again, I'm going to... Um not claim any legal um, <laughs> authority in this area. All I would say is, as it currently reads, it says you operate under the RMA until that MBA is in place and then you transition. But as I've also said, we've also got these regional planning committees and regional um, planning spatial strategies that will come into place. So in a sense, we have to give earlier allegiance to that higher level direction uh, than, yeah. There, there, there's a lot of uncertainty still. Dale Marie. Lou, you're kind of sounding like um, Māori when it comes to legislative changes, because at the end of the day, I tell you what's really concerning for us as Māori, every legislation change around water reform we have to then go back, spend a lot of money as we to get our settlement, still maintain that settlement space. I'm looking at all the legislative changes that Maya We Quota has put together around these changes to the water reform. Every time legislation change, Māori have to try and solidify these settlements again and again and again. And we do that on top of all the other stuff that we're doing, housing, everything else. So it kind of sounded like you were chirping from our end of the, the, the waka that keep getting everything taken off us. We have to reaffirm our place everywhere. And at the end of the day, the water is still crying out for help. And it is sad that 10 years away, and, the, the, and I hear the words of uncertainty. Māori have had to live with uncertainty for so many years around watching the water be degraded. And we're still playing as a political game around the water. And water is the most important thing for all of us in this world. We're still selling it offshore and buying it back in bottles. We're still drilling under river. I know as Iwi, we just <coughs> gave Auckland all that, all that water. And now they're drowning in water. And it's kind of like, we get no concessions as Waikato Iwi for all the stuff that we do here. So I hear you over there, Lou, but you're actually chiming to sound like Iwi, because Iwi have been saying this for over 100 years. Legislation stuffs us up daily. So Kaaruha hoki kia koutou, Konihira. Welcome to Māori Dim's world. Tēnā koutou. Thank you, Dale. Um, Monty. Just, mm -hmm. uh, thanks, David. Just seeking clarification, the regional planning committees they are made up of political uh, politicians are they and the exec is staff is that that's right it 
going by the wording in the legislation, it says representatives of the council. So yes, they would presumably be councillor appointees um, on that body. But it doesn't, it's not specific in terms of who exactly. So yeah. So potentially could be whoever you want. Yeah, but they need not be elected reps. So yeah. It can be your well, appointed expert. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, Lou. Uh, thank you. Just right at the end, okay, we have changes with immediate effect. Okay, uh, some changes for the new law started on the 24th of August 2023. So it's fast track consenting. Are they altering? What are they? You know, we are not, I'm not knowledgeable of what they're actually going to alter. The new maximum duration for any new freshwater related consent. So obviously they're going to put a time frame on that. But we, once again, I'm, I'm ignorant of what that actually mm. means. And council changes to council enforcement powers. I'm not so sure about that either. And changes to the management of contaminated land. These, all of these issues. Yeah. As a commissioner, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I haven't read anything on that yet, or no. even seen. I don't know how many. Perhaps I'm incorrect in stating this, but yeah. And changes to aquaculture management. Yeah. All of those are very important issues for a local council. That's a good question, um, Luke. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the legislation website and the environment um, reform website for a bit more information. The last two points are regional council related. Um, it's tightening up. It's basically making it tighter than it currently is. The one that does apply to us is the third one, which is changes to council enforcement powers and penalties, and it's increased our ability to impose penalties um, and our enforcement powers, which will be good news to Carl Tati, I would think. Um, the new maximum duration for freshwater consents is simply, again, imposing a tighter restriction so that you don't have consents granted for really long periods of time that lock up water resources. And then, you know, it, it's an unintended consequence of what we've currently got. Um, and the fast track consenting is simply um, endorsing what was brought in during COVID, which allowed for a fast track consenting for certain infrastructure um, and related to um, new housing um, developments. Yep. It, that, that just means like the three by three by three, as we call it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that correct? Or, or well, yeah, yeah, it could be. Yep. Yep. Could be. Um, if if there's nothing else, I'll, th there's one other piece of update for you: um, the national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity. Um, that was also came into effect fourth of August, um, and being national level, we have to implement it. Um, and what does that mean for us? Um, well, firstly, you might remember there was quite a lot of criticism of the first draft legislation that was put out um, and the, the issues and options paper. Um, and it has been pleasingly very much tightened up. Um, it's a lot tighter, better read than it was. Um, a lot of the early actions lie with the regional council. Um, they are to uh, prepare regional biodiversity strategies by 2033. So again, nothing tomorrow, that's a way off. They're to set minimum targets of 10% indigenous vegetation cover for urban and non-urban areas. And if you think of WIPA, that's quite a tall ask, 10%. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see, again, a place like Hamilton, how you would achieve that. Um, anyway, so those are targets. So they're not um, anything more than a target at this stage. What does it mean for WIPA? Uh, one of the first requirements is a plan change to identify all significant natural areas by 2028. We already have that in place. So it's not something we have to do. We've got that in place, but it does require us to review what we've got and see if it still stacks up. And I think the, the way it reads is that's got to be done by a qualified ecologist. So do our SNAs, our significant natural areas, stack up? 
Um, and then what is new is we have to include provisions in the district plan for assessing resource consents that have significant impacts on indigenous biodiversity. And we've got to do that by 2031. So we do do some work there. And we also to work with Tangata Whenua to identify Tonga indigenous species for mapping in the district plans. So that's a, a consultation requirement that's come in. Um, and this, this ties back to what we were talking about with the new planning and resource management legislation in the, these are, this is a national policy statement. This will get wrapped into that new national planning framework as, as part of that. And it, when that comes into effect, this will be part of that. And we have to give effect to it, regardless of the fact that we're still under the RMA and that's a coming in as under the new legislation. So this is where you get this gray area of overlap between the two. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a really great update. Are there any questions? No, very good. Okay. All right, well, we'll call it a day, I think. Yeah, that, thank you very much. Yeah, no, no, that was a really good update. Okay, everybody, that, that, that's us for the day. Um, there are um, other meetings this afternoon for some of us. So uh, otherwise we shall see you all next week. Um, those who are going to Queenstown tomorrow, me, hooray, Marcus, Roger, Lou. We will all see you. We will see you next week. Oh, Wayne, Wayne's coming down too. So yeah. So before we before we all go, we'll just uh, hand over to Dalmarie just to um, finish off the day. Thanks. <laughs>